Hello everyone, how are you? <clears throat> My name is Dr. Castro. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we're going to go um, and review. Hi, how are you? How's everyone? We're going to actually um, spend about six hours today talking about rheumatology. Um, actually, rheumatology is a very... Hello, Pawan. Hello, Safi. Raman. Okay, so um, rheumatology is really, really a very simple topic, um, but it can be very confusing, and at the same time, it's very high yield for the step two. Um, so what I want to start with is actually making sure that you know how to differentiate between the different subgroups of, of conditions that exist in rheumatology. Now, but before we start all that, um, let me tell you where I am. My name is Manuel Castro. I'm a board-certified internist. I have a, I'm a, I specialize in HIV/AIDS medicine. I have my practice in South Florida. Uh, I've been teaching for Kaplan for 14 years, um, and um, I teach almost. All, all, almost all the topics of internal medicine. I teach for step one for pathology. Now, what about you guys? Tell me where you're from. I'm originally from the Dominican Republic, actually, but I've lived here for over 30 years. Mexico, Alejandro. Very good. Hola, Venezuela. Memphis, how are you? India. Wow, Ecuador. Brazil, Buffalo, Colombia, Pakistan, ah, Utah, Bahamas, India, Washington. Hey, I was just in Washington. Okay, California, New Jersey, South Sudan, lives in Minnesota. Okay, perfect. Dubai, Dhabi, Abu Dhabi, huh? Ethiopia. Very good. So why don't we start... Um, our topic of rheumatology. You're going to see that after you're done with this, it's going to be a very, very simple topic. Um, so what I want to start, first of all, is to kind of group um, the diseases that you're going to see in rheumatology. And so what I want to first start with is actually start making you think about the different subgroups of diseases, one of them being um, the inflammatory conditions and the other being the non-inflammatory condition and now there are signs and symptoms that you will be given on a specific vignette that will actually point towards the fact that it is inflammatory or non-inflammatory for example um, somebody that comes to you with joint pain and they have malaise fatigue fever or maybe not even fever, but just anorexia, um, just just feeling sick. Um, probably, if I would tell you, it would be sort of like when you get a bad, bad cold before you get any symptoms of the cold. Whatever you feel at that moment, those are symptoms of inflammation. So make sure that you pay attention to those symptoms because you want to make sure that you know you classify. Um, rheumatological conditions into either inflammatory or non-inflammatory. Then the next thing that you have to classify it in is either monoarticular or polyarticular. Is it only one joint affected or is it many other joints affected? Why is that? Because if it's only one joint, the, the, the differential diagnosis is very, going to be very finite. Okay, So you're going to have the crystal induced arthritis such as gout, pseudogout, you're going to have septic arthritis, right? And you're going to have trauma. Those are going to be the major ones that you're going to actually start thinking about a single inflamed joint, red, hot, swollen, okay? So that's the next thing, to actually differentiate between, um, you know, monoarticular or polyarticular, okay? And then you're going to actually uh, analyze the different types of joints that are being affected. Why is that? Because certain conditions spare certain joints. For example, and these are really high yield topics for the step two, rheumatoid arthritis never affects the distal interphalangeal joints. Osteoarthritis 
the arthritis of aging never affects these joints, the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Another joint that rheumatoid arthritis, other than the distal to phalangeal joints, does not affect is the low back. So if somebody comes with low back pain, you should consider another diagnosis other than rheumatoid arthritis. Then, then I want you to actually um, group them in a different way. Okay. So, so far we have monoarticular, polyarticular, inflammatory, and non-inflammatory. If it's non-inflammatory, it's going to be most likely uh, osteoarthritis. Now, the next thing that I want you to think of is, um, you know, if it affects mostly the actual axial skeleton, okay, those most of the time are the seronegative uh, spondyloarthropathy that affect actually the the spine and the low back. Usually, they usually have the low back affected. Okay, so there's a group of disease that actually affect the low back, um, and you have in those ankylosing spondylitis. You can have inflammatory bowel disease affects the actual, um, you know, uh, axial skeleton. Okay, you can also have psoriatic arthritis that affects the axial skeleton, um, and we're going to talk about a couple of others. So. Remember, those are the actual writers, or it's not, we don't call it writers anymore, but reactive arthritis. And those are the four big ones that you have to remember that affect the actual axial skeleton. Okay? Um, and then we're going to talk about them and put them together. And then um, finally, at the end, we're going to talk about the vasculitis, the different types of vasculitis um, that we see. And most of the treatment for the vasculitis are going to be um, pretty much in the same um, uh, kind of uh, uh, treatment plan that you're going to do. So once you know one treatment, you're going to know most of them. You just have to differentiate all these diseases and how to make a, a good differential diagnosis. So now let's start. I'd like to start with a, a, a case here. And let's see here what we have. We have a 67-year-old female who has had joint pain, swelling, and stiffness for one year. So very important also to pay attention to the fact, is it acute versus chronic? Why is that? Because if it is acute, um, you're going to think of conditions such as gout, pseudogout, septic, um, trauma. Uh, so things that are much more acute. When it's chronic, then you think of the other conditions that are a little bit more indolent that come to play with. And most of the acute ones tend to be a single joint that is affected. But that doesn't necessarily mean you can have actually multiple joints affected, which when it's acute, especially if you have a viral infection, which can cause joint pain, um, you know, and could be pretty acute as well. So, um, so she's got this problem for one year. She's 67 years old, so definitely she could have a degenerative disease, right? Uh, because she's on the older side. The pain and stiffness begin in her elbows and wrists bilaterally. Very important, okay, the word bilateral here, okay? So she's got wrists and elbow bilaterally affected, okay? Two joint areas so far affected, mostly in the morning and lasting over an hour, okay? Very important to pay attention also to the fact that it's lasted over an hour. Why is that? Because most inflammatory condition, okay, usually have morning stiffness that lasts more than 30 minutes. Non-inflammatory conditions, their morning stiffness lasts less than 30 minutes. So even though this woman is 67 years old and you, you want to think that because of her age she might have osteoarthritis, um, it doesn't go with, the, that, with, with this presentation here. Um, the fact that it's bilateral, okay, and the fact that it's actually more than, than bilateral because you can have osteoarthritis that's bilateral, that morning stiffness lasting over 30 minutes tells me that this is an inflammatory condition, okay? So now we know we have an inflammatory condition that is chronic. So now we're going to have to do a little bit more reading to try to differentiate which of the different inflammatory conditions she might have. Six months ago, she was also star she started to notice some marked morning stiffness and swelling of her knees and the proximal interphalangeal joints of her hands bilaterally and lasting over an hour. So now we've got a couple of things here that are really important. 
in rheumatology we have what's called clinical um, uh, 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 parameters that you will use to make diagnosis, clinical criteria to make diagnosis for certain diseases. So for example, for rheumatoid arthritis, we don't necessarily have to do a test. As long as we have significant amount of clinical criteria, we can make a diagnosis without any further testing. One of the clinical criteria is going to be that you have three joint areas affected simultaneously. Like for example, this patient who's got the elbows, the wrists, the knees, and she also have the proximal interphalangeal joints, right? So very typical, those are three areas affected at the same time. Not only that, another criteria for rheumatoid arthritis is bilateral joint pain. Another criteria is morning stiffness greater than an hour. Or in another criteria is that one of the hand joints, okay, either the wrists, the, metacarp uh, the proximal interphalangeal joints, or the metacarpophalangeal joints are affected. So this patient actually has two of, the, of those joint areas affected. So we're almost ready, and I can almost certainly say that th this woman has um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis just because of the criteria that she has. Now, she has no rashes, no hair loss, or back pain. These are the diagnoses that would imply something like SLE, okay, systemic lupus erythematos, okay, a rash, uh, hair loss, okay, and she doesn't have any back pain, okay, so that's very important, or ulcers too, right, right, now back pain she doesn't have, so that's a good thing because that goes with the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, now she's got generalized fatigue, anorexia, and weakness, which are also present, these are evidence of inflammation. So we know we have an inflammatory process, right? Now, there is no history of fever, weight loss, or diarrhea. Now, there are certain conditions that actually can present with fever, weight loss, diarrhea, that is inflammatory and that can cause joint pain as well, sometimes indistinguishable from rheumatoid arthritis. Absolutely, arunina, aru, arunima. Um, inflammatory bowel disease can do that, but they say that she doesn't have any diarrhea, so therefore it's not going to be inflammatory bowel disease. On exam, her temperature is 37, so temperature is normal. There is warmth, swelling, and tenderness of the knees, wrists, elbow, metacarpophalangeal joints, and proximal interphalangeal joints symmetrically. So now we know that it is symmetrical and that she has three joint areas affected and that one of them is the actual um, hand joints, right? So it's almost for, uh, almost sure she has a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, right? The distal interphalangeal joints are normal, which we know that rheumatoid arthritis does not affect the distal interphalangeal joints. There is no hair loss, no oral ulcers, very important, because if she has no, no hair or, or oral ulcers or rash, we're not going to think of what condition that causes hair loss oral ulcers and rash. SLE, very good. Yes, SLE. So the lungs are clear, okay? The cardiopulmonary examination reveals no murmur, rubs or gallops, and the abdomen has no hepatosplenomegaly. Her hands reveal ulnar deviation of the digits. So the digits are deviated to the ulnar side. Now, what happens in, in this condition Okay, and this is this is actually uh, this woman's hand. Okay, the ulnar deviation over here. You can see that. Okay, that she has that ulnar deviation, right? Okay, now, now yes, now which of the following is the best initial treatment to reduce the inflammation in this patient? Huh? Well, we thought that they were going to ask you. Um, the diagnosis. You know, in the first question, I'm not going to ask you the diagnosis. In the other ones, I want to make sure that you know what the diagnosis is. We're going to be actually um, reviewing it because you have to know the diagnosis. Okay. Well, Jose, we don't want to use aspirin. Aspirin has a lot of issues, right? Acetaminophen, Susan, does not actually reduce inflammation, okay? Um, so, what is a good first-line drug that is used to reduce inflammation? Yes, it's going to be glucocorticoids, right? So, 
But remember, acetamina fen is only used in patients uh, for pain because it doesn't have an anti-inflammatory component. So we use it, for example, for patients with osteoarthritis. You can give them acetamina it should be the first line drug in patients. We leave it for the cardiologist, okay? Because aspirin has irreversible platelet aggregation inhibition, and you know that can cause a bunch of problems, especially on a 67-year-old. Here, um, we might not want to use that right now, right? Now, etanercept. Etanercept is what, is what type of drug? Etanercept. Tumor necrosis factor. It's a biological, right? Okay, yes. Antagonist, yes, a DMARD, right? But remember, what happens with the DMARD is, and we, don't, we won't use a Tarnicept as a first-line drug, right? Um, they don't actually start working for a few months. So we have to give the patients always something for the inflammation right from the beginning, okay? So make sure you always give them something for the inflammation, either a glucocorticoid or maybe even an NSAID if they give it to you. So those are going to be the best drugs. So that glucocorticoid would be the best. Now, what is rituximab? Rituximab. Yes, anti-CD20. Anti-CD20. And a CD20 is what type of lymphocytes? What lymphocytes have CD20? B cells, right? B cells. And B cells usually have the, the CD markers are above 10, right? Remember that? Above 10 B lymphocytes, right? And then the T lymphocytes, the CD markers are below 10. So, you know, for CD4, CD8, CD2, CD7, all those are T cell lymphocytes. Uh, lymphocytes. So rituximab is a CD20 in, um, uh, uh, inhibitor, right? So now, am I cutting in and out, or is it your Rika? I'm good. Okay, good. So Rika, it must be your 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 um, your internet connection. Make sure that you are connected directly um, to the internet and not on a wireless. Okay, so the answer here is glucocorticoid. So let's continue a little bit more. Let's continue a little bit more here. Okay, and we're going to actually talk about rheumatoid arthritis. Which of the following is the most specific test for rheumatoid arthritis? Which is the most specific test for rheumatoid arthritis? Okay. Um, Let's see if I can get that, uh, my, yeah, those Q&A from the bottom. Can we remove that so I can actually have the screen a little bit bigger? I'd like to, okay. So, which of the following is the most specific test for rheumatoid arthritis? Okay, let's see here. Is it rheumatoid factor? Is it anti-centromere and ANA yeah most of you are saying four 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 huh? anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide or C anca correlates with disease activity but even better than rheumatoid factor for co correlation for disease activity would be the ESR or the C-reactive protein. Okay, now let me make a little parenthesis, guys, here, and uh, listen to what I'm going to say. For your step two, there's a series of things that you have to know, okay? Remember, when you're going to take a test, you have to know what is expected of you. Uh, remember, med medicine is so vast that you cannot actually learn everything that exists, right? So you have to kind of compromise with the type of knowledge that you're going to decide to learn and the one that you don't necessarily have to know at that moment, right? So one of the things that you have to know, okay, remember for the step two, is they want you to be able to recognize most of the common condition, medical condition that exists, right? So definitely making a diagnosis is going to be your number one uh, uh, priority and based on a clinical presentation, be able to make a diagnosis. It's going to be your number one priority. 
most of the time in the test they're not going to ask you directly the the actual diagnosis that you're going to actually uh, have there but they might ask you something related to that diagnosis okay so there's a couple of steps that you have number one is how to confirm the diagnosis okay it's very easy to think of a condition okay but remember in medicine 2 plus 2 is not equal to 4 so sometimes something sounds like a disease and might not be so you have to have an objective way to confirm the diagnosis okay so what is the test that you do to make a confirmatory diagnosis very very important they're going to ask you that over and over and over and over again okay because remember that we sometimes think of one condition and you know we end up with something completely different but as long as we are able to either prove that it is or that it is not you're doing the right thing right so that's the first thing confirmation of the diagnosis the second thing is going to be what is the in a step two in a step three it gets more into management but in a step two what they want to make sure is that you know what is the initial drug that you're going to use on a patient okay that's going to be more important than anything else not only that if a patient is already on a specific drug that you're able to recognize side effects from medications okay now complex treatments are usually not involved for a step two but initial drug is going to be important initial management okay um, and the initial management is most of the time uh, management that you don't need to have somebody supervise you um, because remember you're going to be doing a residency and you're going to actually have supervision so most of the time initial management involve at least if it is in a hospital involve the, the time when you are actually alone doing your calls which could be anywhere from six to eight hours so that would be initial management so in a condition that is very serious like for example DKA that would involve the complete management of DKA because you're going to be there by yourself and you're not going to wait for somebody to come so that you can actually um, manage the patient so th those are the things that you have to think of then the next thing is once you actually have selected the initial management you should be able to do no harm meaning that if you choose on a patient to give them glucocorticoid do you know what are the contraindications for glucocorticoids because if you don't know the contraindication you shouldn't be using a drug right so it's very important to do no harm so once you decide you're going to start the patient on a glucocorticoid did you look for the things that you needed to look for in a patient that was going to get glucocorticoid is his blood pressure okay are you going to monitor his blood pressure is his blood sugar okay okay um, so a series of things that you're going to actually look for and make sure that you do not cause any harm to the patient right so those are the those are the big 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 thing and then the next thing is do you have a way to actually follow the disease activity have you done a test to be able to actually say objectively that the patient is improving with a type of treatment that you're giving so in a patient for example with rheumatoid arthritis they're probably going to ask you you know what is the you know what is the initial test that you're going to actually request um, to follow the disease activity and so you know that it's going to be either an ESR or C-reactive protein and then they'll ask you sometime down the line if you repeated it again after you started the patient on medication so that you can actually assess objectively that the patient has been improving okay so those are things that are really really important on a step two okay that you actually pay attention to those things okay yes um, well that's well you know it now okay you're welcome you're welcome so now let's talk about anticyclic citrullinated peptide is a great great test to actually confirm the diagnosis if you were in doubt okay and that actually is going to confirm your diagnosis okay so it's very important to know that piece of information because you are going to actually be asked that kind of question what is the best test what is the most diagnostic test for rheumatoid arthritis right now what is the principal um, infiltrating cells 
in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Now, something that also is, is happening, yes, absolutely, T lymphocytes, right? So T lymphocytes are going to be the principal trading cells in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, right? T lymphocytes, T lymphocytes are going to be the pre present. Now remember what happens is that also you also develop, um, you know, these patients in their joints will develop this granulation tissue. These granulation tissues will have a lot of fibroblasts these fibroblasts are going to contract and are going to cause all the deformity that you're going to see in the patient's hands in these patients, okay? So yes, T lymphocytes are going to be the principal cells that you're going to see in these patients. So very good so far. Okay, Safi. So let's talk a little bit more. Um, yes, their rheumatoid arthritis tends to get better. Uh, Jonas, with uh, if you have low uh, low CD4, yes. Okay, so now let's talk here about um, initial treatment for patients um, with rheumatoid arthritis. First of all, we're going to give them anti-inflammatories. Remember that I said either an NSAID or corticosteroids. Um, the problem is that um, and the reason why we do this is because if we start them on a disease modifying agent it takes about four to five months for that agent to occur to start working so we have to give them something else to kind of keep them while keep the inflammation down while their disease modifying agents actually start to um, kick in for them right um, aspirin usually has a lot of side effects uh, uh, GI side effects and it's very non-specific uh, Sadaf. So we don't want to use aspirin for patients with rheumatology and the dose of the aspirin would be so high that it actually would cause a lot of side effects. So, um, and remember it, it, it inhibits platelet aggregation irreversibly so if for whatever reason you need to stop it, it's going to take a little while longer for that to um, uh, reverse itself, okay? So NSAIDs, um, non-selective or selective COX-2 inhibitors. Remember that NSAIDs actually work in the um, arachidonic pathway, okay, in the actual blocking the cyclooxygenase pathway of arachidonic acid, which is actually one of the main important uh, pathways for inflammation. And remem remember that it'll block the prostaglandins, right? Prostaglandin I2, D2, E2 that is involved in inflammation, pain, so on and so forth. We also have COX-2 inhibitors such as Selecobix that actually just blocks the actual cyclooxygenase 2, which is much more specific for um, uh, inflammation than, um, than the actual non-selective COX-1 and COX-2. Um, it does have a little bit more issues because it tends to actually shift the actual production of prostaglandins to, uh, to, to a thrombotic type of agent, uh, which is called thromboxan, and causes a lot of heart and CNS problems, okay? So we want to stay away from Selecobix. There's a few others that were removed from the market as well. So corticosteroid, also an anti-inflammatory, very good to be to use while the patient is actually waiting for uh, their the disease-modifying agents to take place, right? And now you're going to use this drug uh, use until other medications take effect. So first of all, every patient with rheumatoid arthritis, you have to start them either on an NSAID or a corticosteroid until their disease-modifying agent starts to take effect, right? So. There, four of the following criteria are used to establish the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, let's see what are the criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. And I want you to know these very, very well, okay? Because these criteria are clinical criteria, okay? Clinical criteria. Morning stiffness in and around joints for at least one hour. And our patient had that. Remember that? Then synovitis meaning inflammation of the joint of at least three joint areas simultaneously 
and our patient had that. So we have two, okay? So remember, you need four criteria here. So we have already one and two. Synovitis of the proximal interphalangeal joint, metacarpal phalangeal joints, and wrists. Remember, our patient had the proximal interphalangeal joints and the wrists affected. So we have three of them, right? Symmetric joint swelling, and our, pa our patient had that. So guess what? We have four criteria already and we were able to make the diagnosis with any further testing done, okay? Um, any one is good, yeah, any of any one is good. Uh, now, rheumatoid factor or anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide can be another criteria, okay? And ESR or C-reactive protein that's elevated is another criteria. So you have to have one, two, three, and four, whichever four you want from those, okay? any four of those, okay? As long as you have four of them, you have made the diagnosis, okay? Now, if you have only three clinical here, you're going to need one of these two, okay? And probably the best one to actually look uh, use is going to be anticyclic citrullated peptide, which is the more specific one, right? Now, it used to be that rheumatoid nodules were a criteria for rheumatoid arthritis that has been removed, okay? So a rheumatoid nodule is not anymore a criteria. Okay, yes, yeah, six weeks, absolutely, Arunina. You need to have six weeks of these symptoms. Very good. Yes, very good. Six weeks. It's not, you know, a week or ten days or something like that. It has to be at least six weeks. And then the x-ray shows erosion and periarticular osteopenia in the hands and wrists. That used to be another criteria, but that has also been removed, okay? So remember those criteria so that you can make a good diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Now, as you can see here, one of the things that I want to show to you is that rheumatoid arthritis actually affects the metacarpophalangeal joints, okay, and the proximal interphalangeal joints. So, metacarpophalangeal joints over here, and the actual proximal interphalangeal joints over here. So, as you can see, it affects these joints, and right over here as well, and over here. But these ones are the most affected. You can see how damaged they are. And then this one has a ulnar deviation already of the digits over here. Okay? Now, one of the things that you're going to see is that you're going to see around the joints, you see the area over here that it looks actually a little bit um, osteopenic. Okay? And why does that occur? Well, very simple. Anytime you don't use a joint, if your joints, if your hands are inflamed, you're probably not going to use it. And you have this morning stiffness for about an hour or so every morning. So if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So any time that you actually are not able to move a joint, you're going to have periarticular osteopenia around that joint. You're going to see that in patients, for example, with ankylosing spondylitis, where the spine fuses completely, they're not going to actually... Their, their spine is going to become osteoporotic, right? So anything, anywhere where you have significant inflammation, you're going to have a little bit of osteoporosis. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, if it affects a lot of their joints of their body, they're actually going to be prone to osteoporosis at an earlier age because they're not moving that much, okay? So they're not moving that much, and that will cause a little bit of osteoporosis, right? Now, let's look at what happens with the joints in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. As you see here, we've got the actual um, cartilage, okay, we've got the tendons around the joint, we have the synovium, we have the synovial fluid which is in here, all throughout here, okay. We've got the joint capsule over here, okay, and then this is the bone over here, right. Well, what happens with patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis is that they have, as you can see here, they have this reactive, uh, the reaction that occurs in their synovium. And see here, the synovium becomes very inflamed, okay? They start to develop granulation tissue. The actual cartilage starts to get eroded, okay? The bone actually itself gets eroded here in this area and here, okay? And it causes tremendous damage. 
then this granulation tissue here with all the fibroblasts, remember that when you have fibrosis, you tend to actually have a little bit of um, uh, uh, sort of a, a constriction of the fibrosis. And that's what causes all the deformity of the joints, right? As in all the, all, the, all the fibrosis actually contracts, it actually causes the damage and the deformity of the joints in these patients, okay? Yes, Sahif, fibroblasts, myofibroblasts, absolutely. And so all that causes the actual damage to these joints that you're going to see in these patients, okay? So that's basically the pathology of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Now, let's talk about a little bit of an issue here. An x-ray of the hands showed significant erosion in the metacarpophalangeal joints. Okay. Early therapy with which of the following is considered adequate in the initial treatment of this patient? So what should we start very, very soon in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis after you start them on something for their inflammation, right? Okay, let's see cyclosporin. Cyclosporin, I don't think we're going to give them a, 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 this type of drug, right? Acetaminophen doesn't, doesn't really um, work that well in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. It's only good for the pain, right? Allopurinol, great for what condition is allopurinol great for? Gout, right? Absolutely. Methotrexate, yeah, methotrexate. Many of you actually said methotrexate, and I saw that. So methotrexate is a great disease modifying agent, okay? Only has to be used in a very small amount. So, um, you know, it's, it has great result as a disease modifying agent, okay? Um, and we already have the patient on systemic glucocorticoid, so we don't need to actually give them more, right? Okay, so definitely I agree with you that methotrexate is the best drug that you can actually give them, right? So now let's see here. The appropriate steps are taken, and you start the patient on the above medication. And the above medication is methotrexate, right? Methotrexate. You don't have to know doses, Eddie. Don't, you don't have to know how much. It's twice a week, and you don't have to know the dose. Um, the appropriate steps are taken, and you start the patient on the above medication, which is methotrexate, right? How would you monitor the major side effects of this medication. One of the major side effects of this medication, let's see, no monitoring is necessary since side effects are rare with this medication. Well, it's true, at the, at the dose that we use methotrexate, the, the side effects are going to be rare, but definitely there are going to be some side effects, right? Yearly visual exam, what medication that we use in rheumatology do we have to have yearly visual exam and remember guys that I'm actually giving you a lot of stuff here yes Rika hydroxychloroquine absolutely hydroxychloroquine we have to actually do yearly visual exam now monthly liver function tests would that be appropriate for a patient with methotrexate would you want to actually start on monthly liver uh, get monthly now that you actually, most of you are saying yes, what other lab tests should you also monitor on patients that are taking methotrexate? Absolutely, a CBC, right? A CBC as well, okay? Very important to actually monitor those things. Okay, now, uh, monthly rheumatoid factor. You know what? Rheumatoid factor really is not that great of a... Of a um, uh, uh, it's not that that great of an issue, right? Rheumatoid factor, not that great of an issue. Um, not only that, it's not a good marker. Sometimes it could be normal in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, sometimes it could be elevated. And home glucose measurement, uh, if we were talking about glucocorticoid or steroids, we might consider uh, home glucose measurement if we need to, okay? So let's continue here. Monthly liver function test, very important as well as CBC when you are actually starting a patient on methotrexate. So remember that I told you these are things that they're going to ask you most likely on your test, okay? On the USMLE step two, they're probably going to go for those. The patient returns with painful oral ulcer or stomatitis and routine blood work is performed. Her peripheral blood smear is shown, okay? 
Let's see. Let me have a volunteer here. Anybody wants a volunteer? Who wants to volunteer? Me, me. Okay. Arashtip. Arashtip. Let's see here. Okay. So what do you have here, Arashtip? What do you have? Polysegmented neutrophils, right? Over here. How many lobes should a neutrophil have? How many lobes should a neutrophil have? Yeah, less than five. Less than five, right? And this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So definitely. What does that tell you about the the condition that this patient has here? Megaloblastic, yeah, megaloblastic anemia, right? Okay. And so what kind of, based on that, let me just see what we have, okay. Which of the following is the most likely cause of her peripheral smear finding? Is it anemia of chronic disease? No. Iron deficiency anemia? No. Right? Sideroblastic anemia. What will we see in the peripheral smear in sideroblastic anemia? Let's see if you guys actually had your... What do you see in sideroblastic? Vasophilic stipling, right? Vasophilic stipling, right? Okay. Now, side effects of medication. Is this a side effects of medication that this patient is having? Yes, absolutely. Methotrexate is probably causing this, right? Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. What are you going to see on the peripheral blood smear of a patient with microangiopathic hemolytic anemia? Absolutely, radish, schistocytes, schistocytes. Remember that as the actual red blood cell passes through the mic microcirculation and you have microthrombi formation there, imagine you have a little tiny dot inside the actual capillary like a little, uh, uh, you know, something that shears the red blood cells and destroys it, you have these schistocytes. But in this patient, actually, we have side effects of medication, and we know that methotrexate is one of those conditions that actually causes a uh, significant issue with uh, folate deficiency in patients with, that are taking methotrexate. Okay, now let's look here. Um, now let's see... So what are the side effects of antimetabolites? Liver damage, and that's why we actually got for methotrexate, liver function test. They can cause stomatitis, and they can cause pancytopenia. One of them that you can have is actually <coughs> this uh, macro, macrocytic anemia that's very, very no noticeable, especially with these uh, hypersegmented neutrophils on peripheral smear, and that's why we also get a regular CBC for these patients, right? Um, so, okay. So let's continue. It's once a year that you need to actually check um, eye examination, okay, in patients. Now, um, you can from 6 to 12 months, but once a year is fine enough. Now, treatment guidelines for rheumatoid, rheumatology, okay? Uh, so remember, disease-modifying um, anti-rheumatic drugs, okay, take about three to six months, and it should start within three months of the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So within three months of the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, you should start a disease-modifying agent, okay? So within three months of, of, the, of the disease. Now, if the patient does not have joint erosion, this is very, very high yield to know this, this here, okay? If the patient does not have joint erosion, the drugs, the disease-modifying agents that you're going to start are going to be hydroxychloroquine, okay? Remember, ophthalmologic consultation every 6 to 12 months. If you do it every 12 months, you're good enough with that, okay? Um, Remember, they're not gonna. They're they're gonna give you a range of time here. Okay, so don't 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 be too strict with yourselves and trying to uh, nitpick on you know dates and things like that. As long as you know that you actually have to do eye examination on a periodical basis, that's all you need to know. Okay, so hydrochloroquine. Okay, um, if no joint erosion. Remember, very important for a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. 
to actually see if they have joint erosion. Um, and if they do not have joint erosion, you can use hydrochloroquine, sulfasalacin, very safe in pregnancy. So they might give you a patient who is pregnant with rheumatoid arthritis, and they might ask you, and she does not have joint erosion, and then might ask you, what are you going to actually start this patient as a disease modifying agent? So fasalacine should be your best choice. And minocycline is also another drug that can be used for patients with no joint erosion. Now, if the patient has joint erosion, okay, then you should start methotrexate. Okay? It inhibits inflammatory cytokines. So remember, the inflammatory cytokines is what's going to cause a lot of the problems. Inflammation is, what is, is going to be one of the uh, issues that is going to cause more of the damage of the joints in these patients. And then you can also use leflunomide, okay, which prevents the autoimmune lymphocytic expansion in these patients as well. So you can use either methotrexate or leflunomide. Okay, methotrexate being the number one choice if there is joint erosion. Remember, you have to use it within three months of the actual uh, the disease itself. Okay, now this is what you're going to see in patients with hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine retinopathy, which actually leads to a, what's called the bull's, bull's eye retinopathy. And you can see that here, okay, all that. That's the retinopathy right here, okay the bullseye. Look at it over here too. Okay. All that. Burn that image in your mind. Okay. Okay. So that's actually, um, so you actually have to have eye examination for those patients on a periodic basis. Now, let's see what happens here. Um, if the patient, after you start the patient on a disease modifying agent, okay, whichever it is, depending on if the patient had joint erosion or no joint erosion, you're going to either use, you know, hydroxychloroquine if it's no joint erosion. If it's joint erosion, maybe methotrexate, right? Then you assess the patient again, right? And usually you assess the patient anywhere from 6 to 12 months, right? Uh, not 6 to 12 months, 6 weeks to 12 weeks. Um, and then at that time, if improvement but not full response to methotrexate, okay, then you can add a tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitor. And remember, tumor necrosis factor alpha, go back to your, um, you know, um, inflammation, and remember that this is one of the uh, uh, cytokines that is very important in inflammatory processes. So if you can block that cytokine, you actually block the inflammatory process that causes the damage in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so very important. You also should get a PPD before you start, okay, on any tumor necrosis factor because it reduces your ability to actually fight diseases such as tuberculosis, okay? Now, you should not use two biological agents together due to the increased risk of infection. What are the other biological agents that you have here? You have adalimumab, Etarnicept, infliximab, and then as of 2012, okay, there are a couple of newer ones, golimumab and sertolizumab, okay? I would actually write it down if you don't have it in your book, these two. It's been already two years, so around after two years, actually, these drugs can actually start to appear on your test, okay? So the big ones are going to be adalimumab, etarnicept, and infliximab. Okay, and then golimumab and sertolizumab are also very important drugs. Now, if you have no response to disease-modifying agent, let's say that you don't have any response to actually the methotrexate that you started on this patient, then you can use things like abatacept, okay, which is a T-cell co-stimulation inhibitor. Um, no, they're not superior, Riksha, not at all. They're just others that have appeared in the market, but you should be aware of them because um, it's been already two years. No, they don't, don't necessarily have any superiority, one from the others. Can be used. So, Abatacept, if there has been no uh, improvement. So, remember, if there's improvement but not full, 
you're going to use a tumor necrosis alpha inhibitor. If there is no improvement at all, then you're going to use abatacept, which is a T-cell co-stimulation inhibitor, okay, and rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, okay? And so that's kind of the, the, the big um, uh, treatment that you should know. Um, yeah, yes, you continue on methotrexate if there is some response, okay? If there is some response, continue on methotrexate. Okay, let's take a 10-minute break here, and then we're going to return after the break, okay?
So welcome back. Um, let's uh, continue with our topic here, and we're still talking about rheumatoid arthritis. So let's let's see a couple of little things here that I'd like. Ooh, what happened there? Hmm. Let's see. Um, a patient returns to you after two years of treatment for a pre-op evaluation for an elective cholecystectomy under general anesthesia. Prior to the surgery, assessment of which of the following areas is most important? Well, let's see. I guess um, three, two of them are not showing up for whatever reason. Sometimes the conversion um, from PowerPoint to so the program actually tends to do a little trick on us here. Yes, actually, that Denise, Denise, cervical spine, definitely. Actually, the answer is here. So, um, what what happens with the cervical spine? Let me just ask you a couple of things. Where, what, what area of the spine is usually not affected by rheumatoid arthritis? the lower back absolutely the lower back so lumbar spine is not going to be affected but the cervical spine definitely is going to be affected in these patients okay um, the lumbar the cervical spine so always before a patient goes for anesthesia okay and if they're going to be intubated the problem is that they can have atlantoaxial subluxation and so if they have significant uh, disease in their cervical spine okay you should alert the actual um, anesthesiologist to actually intubate the patient in a sitting position okay um, so that's something that might be a little bit high yield to know so they want you to know that if there is significant cervical spine disease on a patient that's going to surgery that you should alert the anesthesiologist so that the appropriate type of intubation is taken place and they don't cause damage to the actual neck in these patients so now let's see here in advising this patient about her condition, you inform her that her condition predisposes her to which of the following? Ostasis, uh, uh, the, uh, uh cystica. In what condition do you see that? Ostasis cystica. In what condition do you see ostasis fibrosa cystica? No, oh, and hyperparathyroidism, right? Yeah, safiv, right? Okay, what about osteitis dystrophia deformans? In what condition do you see that? Yes, Denise, Pagets. So this is not, this patient doesn't have any of those, right? What about osteoporosis? Is this condition going to place this patient at increased risk for osteoporosis? Ah. Yes, not only the steroid use, but remember what I said, that these patients are going to have this morning stiffness that's going to last for hours and hours. They're not going to be able to move, and this causes actually osteopenia on this patient and osteoporosis, great increased risk of osteoporosis. Now, osteomalacia, what is osteomalacia and what that's caused by? And not only that, they're also receiving um, corticosteroids and all. Yes, vitamin D, osteomalacia, vitamin D. And osteopetrosis, remember, osteopetrosis actually is a inherited condition that actually can cause um, very hard but brittle type of bone. So, yes, very important to know these, okay? So, osteitis fibrosa cystica, hyperparathyroidism, osteodystrophy uh, deformance is Paget's disease, Osteoporosis is seen here in rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Osteomalacia is a lack of vitamin D, okay? And that occurs uh, in, in older patients, right? Um, osteopetrosis is going to be a uh, hereditary disease that has very um, hard brittle bones in these patients and actually can cause a problem for the patient. So in this patient, osteo Porosis is going to be the most important thing that they're going to be predisposed to. Okay, now, rheumatoid arthritis can be associated with other conditions. It is called Kaplan syndrome with a C, not with a K. Okay, when you have also rheumatoid arthritis with a restrictive lung disease affecting the actual lungs. Multiple pulmonary um, uh, uh, nodules and a restrictive lung disease, it's called Kaplan syndrome. And then Felty syndrome is going to be splenomegaly, 
leukopenia, hyperpigmentation, and recurrent gram-positive infections, okay? Felty syndrome. So these two, um, especially Kaplan syndrome, tends to be a little bit high yield. So it's just rheumatoid arthritis with a restrictive lung disease. Restrictive lung disease. And now, one of the symptoms that you're going to have with restrictive lung disease, yes, a pneumoconiosis, right? A pneumoconiosis. Now, so how do a patient, did you already have pulmonary already? Did you already see pulmonary? Yes. Okay, good. So now I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. How does a patient with a restrictive lung disease present? What are the symptoms? No, well, uh, uh, LFTs are not, not liver function tests. You mean PFTs, press, right? No, I want you to tell me. So the symptoms of a restrictive lung disease is going to be dyspnea on exertion and a dry cough. That tells you that the patient has a restrictive lung disease. Dyspnea on exertion and a dry cough. Very typical of patients with restrictive lung disease. So you're going to see that in asbestosis. You're going to see that in berylliosis. You're going to see that in sarcoidosis. You're going to see that in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Right? And then you're actually going to have all the criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. And if you do a pulmonary function test, you're going to see, remember that the pulmonary function test tells you two things. Gives you the volume of the lungs, okay? The total lung capacity and the residual volume. If they're elevated, it's a obstructive condition. If it is reduced, it is a restrictive condition, right? So you're going to have the total lung capacity or the residual volume that is going to be reduced, okay? And then you also have the FEV1 over FVC, which actually tells you in pulmonary function test flow of air. In patients with a restrictive lung disease, the flow of air might not be compromised or might be compromised as well. Okay? So make sure that you know that, okay, how th these things present. So the patient with rheumatoid arthritis that presents with a dyspnea on exertion and a dry cough, check to make sure that they don't have a pneumoconiosis because then this would be called a Kaplan syndrome. And then splenomegaly, leukopenia, hyperpigmentation, gram positive, or uh, uh, recurrent gram positive infections is, is Felty syndrome. So those are the two things that I want you to keep in mind there. Okay? Now let's look at another case here. Okay? And see what's going on. A 25 year old white woman presents to you with swelling and pain of the right calf. Okay? She states that for several months she has had intermittent joint pain and muscle aches, but only had slight swelling of the joints on one occasion. Very mild swelling, okay? Very mild swelling. Um, so what you do is, now, what do we have here? Young patient, is this going to be a degenerative disease such as a patient with um, osteoarthritis, huh? Okay, no, right? Not really. Let's see what else that they, they gave us here. She only had slight swelling of her joints on one occasion and has had intermittent fever and weight loss of 15 pounds. So is this inflammatory or non-inflammatory? Inflammatory or non-inflammatory? Inflammatory, right? Inflammatory. So several weeks ago, she noted a rash on sun-exposed areas, which lasted approximately one week. So she had a rash in sun-exposed area, which lasted about a week. Ah, and this is the rash she had, right? So this is, what type of rash is this? What is it called? What is that rash called? This is what's called no, heliotrope rica is for dermatomyositis, okay? This is a photosensitivity rash, right? Photosensitivity rash. Now, so th this patient has a photosensitivity rash which lasted approximately one week, right? She had also noted some hair loss um, in the past few months. She denies diarrhea, insect bites, or lesions in her mouths. 
Okay. And what type of insect do you think um, are you thinking about in this patient? If they say insect bites, she denies insect bites. What insect can cause bilateral jaw? There we go. Good. Jose, Anthea, Rika. Very good. Very good. Yes. So remember that uh, Lyme's disease can cause this um, uh, joint pain that could be actually confused with either SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, and all these other things, right? Um, and it causes a rash, but it doesn't cause a photosensitivity rash. What is the rash of Lyme's disease called? Erythema chronico migrans. Erythema chronico migrans, right? Erythema chronico migrans, right? Okay. It actually spreads out, okay, and blanches in the middle. Okay. So let's continue here. So they're saying this is not probably Lyme's disease, right? On physical examination, her temperature was 98.6, so this is okay. Her liver was mildly enlarged, so she's got a little bit of a hepatomegaly. And the skin, actually, at this moment, had no rash. This rash actually lasted about eight days after she was in the sun, but right now the patient doesn't have a rash, right? A urine dipstick performed in your office showed a 3-plus positive for proteinuria. Now, what do we have here? Renal damage, right? So we've got renal damage on this patient, okay? Renal damage. Um, which of the following is the most sensitive test for this patient's condition? Well, which of the following, if it is not there, is most likely not going to be exactly the knees? A and A is sensitive, right? Meaning it's a screening test. We want a screening test, right? That's the one that we want. And so ANA is going to be a really good screening test. Most patients with SLE have a positive ANA, right? Now, so 95% of patients have a positive ANA, okay? But again, in lupus, like in rheumatoid arthritis, one of the things that you have to be careful is that, um, you know, we use criteria because you can have a positive ANA on a patient, and still not have lupus, right? So um, these tests are not necessarily very specific. Um, you can have ANAs that are positive in patients with no uh, disease at all. So let's see a little bit more so that we can put all this together. Which of the following is true about this patient's condition? Okay, anti-double-stranded DNA is associated with renal disease. Is that true? True. A lot of you saying no. Okay, let's see. Anti Rho and anti La does not correlate with neonatal lupus. Is that true? That's false, right? Okay, anti Rho and anti La does correlate with neonatal lupus. Okay, SLE cell is related to neonatal lupus. Yes or no? Ah, huh. Actually, SLE cell is just a marker of SLE, right? Okay, drug-induced um, lupus is associated with anticentromere antibodies. Drug-induced lupus. No, which one is associated with uh, drug-induced lupus? What marker? Antihistone antibody. Complement levels C3 and C4 are elevated in lupus? No, they're decreased, right? They're decreased, right? So what is the answer here? This is SLE, uh, as you can see here. This is an SLE cell. It's just a marker of lupus. It doesn't have any correlation with anything. Now. Um, Anti-double-stranded DNA is associated with renal disease, and many of you were saying no, but that's something you need to know. If a patient has renal disease, for example, a patient like the one we had that had 3-plus positive for proteinuria, um, a good test to do is anti-double-stranded DNA. It's very specific for lupus, and it's also associated with renal disease, so most likely you are actually going to have this test positive in these patients. Now, anti rho and anti la is associated with neonatal lupus. SLE cell is actually just a marker of SLE. It's not associated with any specific condition. 
Uh, drug induced lupus is associated with antihistone antibodies, and patients with lupus have a decreased complement C3 and C4, okay, which is going to be low in these patients. Now, let's see a little bit more. Um, how will you treat this patient's skin finding? Skin finding. Now, something else that they could say here, let me just go back here, because sometimes they do actually become a little bit more um, tough with you guys. Sometimes they'll say, um, in SLE, um, which of the following pathways is activated, uh, complement pathways activated? The classical or the alternative? The alternative only, the classical only, um, you know, these are things that they could do. It's very important to know that if C4, okay, C3 can be, a, a, can be part of the alternate and the classical pathway, but C4 is only part of the classical pathway of the complement, okay? So this is the classical pathway that is being activated in patients with SLE. In case they actually ask you that, I'm just giving it to you so that you know that it's the classical pathway. Okay, now, how will you treat this patient's skin findings? Okay, let's see. How are we going to treat the skin findings? What does she have? She had this rash that occurred on sun-exposed areas, right? So we have a couple of people saying corticosteroid for a rash. Not necessarily. Or hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is good for actually, um, you know, for, for the malar rash. But she doesn't have a malar rash. She has a photosensitivity rash. When she goes to the sun, she actually gets this rash. So how should you uh, uh, treat that? Avoid direct sun exposure and use sunscreen. Absolutely. Use sunscreen for these patients, right? So... Now, let's see here. How will you treat this patient's renal manifestation? Now, very important. In SLE, it is very important to know when and how to actually, what conditions you're going to treat with steroids and what conditions you're not going to treat with steroids, right? Well, yes, but that's how we prevent it, Pawan. Yes, maybe the question wasn't com completely... Um, yeah, you, you actually you do, it's a treatment plan, it's a management plan, okay? So it's part of, uh, of, of the treatment, it's actually to avoid sun, direct sun exposure and use sunscreen. Um, that is a treatment, okay? So, yeah, and that will prevent it too, okay? Now, how will you treat this patient's renal manifestation? Let's see, who's got it here? Yes, Safif, Arumina, corticosteroid. Now, very important to know what is going to be the indication for corticosteroids in SLE, okay? So you have to know these indications very well, okay? Now, remember that you do have to do a renal biopsy, okay, uh, in patients with lupus nephritis, but corticosteroids should be started, okay, as soon as you suspect renal disease in these patients because they will not affect the biopsy for about six weeks. So you don't have to wait and do a biopsy, and that's a big question that most people uh, uh, are going to be asking all the time. Um, again, uh, uh, Rika, it depends on the type of what you find in the biopsy, okay, what you're going to do for these patients, okay? So sometimes you might, you know, change your, your treatment plan based on the biopsy result, Okay, and that's why we always want to do a biopsy because there's different type of treatments depending on the type of pathology that exists on the kidneys. But nevertheless, you start always with a steroid, do the biopsy, and then make your decision at that time. Yes, yeah, well, for SLE, with uh, steroids are the best initial drug for SLE when they have certain type of medical condition. So we're going to talk about them in a second. Nabilah, okay? So one of them we already saw, which is actually renal disease, right? Now let's talk about the different um, uh, criteria for the diagnosis of SLE. As you can see, there are many criteria for SLE. Four of the following 11 criteria are needed to make a diagnosis of SLE, okay? So let's talk about them. One of them is a rash, right? And there's three types of rashes that you can have in SLE. 
You can have the malar rash, you can have the discoid rash, and you can have the photosensitivity rash. Then you can also have another condition, which is oral ulcer. That's another criteria. You can also have arthritis. And remember that the arthritis that you're going to all, always see in SLE is non-deforming. It doesn't cause deformity. Very high yield for the step two. You're going to be asked that. You know, that is, does the arthritis of SLE causes deformity? No, it does not cause deformity. Keep that in mind, okay? Now, serositis. What is serositis? Either pericarditis or pleuritis, okay? And then renal disease. Um, that, remember, a biopsy is required, but it doesn't mean that you don't start uh, a corticosteroid before the biopsy. You start the corticosteroid, then you do the biopsy. The neurological disease as well, okay? Now, serositis, renal disease, neurological disease, and even some of the hematologic disorders are usually treated with steroids. So, remember that very well, okay? Now, immunological abnormalities such as anti-double-stranded DNA, anti-Smith antibody, antiphospholipid antibody. Remember that antiphospholipid antibody is going to cause a hypercoagulable state if present on a patient with SLE. So if a patient actually comes to you and presents with sudden onset of shortness of breath, and remember from your pulmonary, sudden onset of shortness of breath is what? Anybody with me here? Sudden onset of shortness of breath. PE or pneumothorax, right? PE or pneumothorax. So if a patient presents with sudden onset of shortness of breath with a, with a history of SLE, okay, and you find that she has a DVT, okay, they're probably going to ask you which of the following is present in this patient. Most likely it's going to be antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, right? Okay. So remember um, those things about pulmonary that you need to know, okay? You need to know all those symptoms in pulmonary. Um, now, immuno immunological abnormalities, so we already talked about that. And then an elevated uh, titers for ANA. So elevated ANA, okay? Elevated ANA is another criteria for SLE. So as you can see, you have 11 criteria. As long as you have four of those criteria, you can make a diagnosis with SLE. Very important to keep in mind that you actually the arthritis is non-deforming and that you treat serositis, which is basically pleuritis and uh, uh, pericarditis with uh, steroid. The renal disease, you treat it with steroid and then you do a biopsy. That you actually uh, treat neurological disease, which is basically psychosis and seizure with steroids as well. And the hematologic abnormalities, for example, hemolytic anemia, uh, immune thrombocytopenia, Leukopenia, steroids work most of the time in those patients. Remember, it is an immune complex rela re related, and what you want to do is actually give the steroids to actually decrease a little bit of the immunity so that the immune complex does not get produced. Yes, there are different criteria, ADAKU. So um, as long as you have ANA, it's, it's just the an ANA marker by itself, it's okay. And then one of the specific ANAs, such as anti-double-stranded DNA, anti-Smith antibody, or anti-phospholipid antibody, would be a second criteria. Yes. Um, a positive test, false positive test for syphilis is also considered within the immunological abnormality here, um, Jonas. Okay. Any immunological abnormality that is actually typical of SLE is, uh, is considered in this group here. Okay. Okay, now let's continue here. Let's talk a little bit about the different types of autoantibodies um, and the clinical association of these autoantibodies in a patient with SLE. Remember, the double-stranded DNA is associated with renal disease, okay? It is usually seen in severe cases of the disease, okay? And it actually correlates with disease activity as well, okay? It is very specific for SLA, okay? Now, okay, let's go back one more time. Any specific qu question, Rika, that you have about this slide?
four, four, up here, look, four, 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 four. Four is all you need, four is all you need. Okay, now let's continue here. I'll put it back in on the, uh, during the break, Rika, so that you can see it. Um, so anti-double-stranded DNA is actually seen in renal disease, severe disease and disease activity, and it go correlates with disease activity. Anti-Smith antibody, also seen in re renal disease and in CNS uh, disease as well, okay? Now, anti rho and anti-LA are normally seen, both of them, in neonatal lupus, okay? Neonatal lupus. Neonatal lupus, okay? And these can actually lead to conduction abnormality on the babies, okay? And then antiphospholipid antibodies. Antiphospholipid antibodies. This is actually associated with thrombosis, right? Yes, it's also uh, arunina. They are also, anti rho and anti la are seen very frequently, both in Sjogren's disease, absolutely, but they're not specific of Sjogren's because you can see it in, in lupus as well. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can actually cause thrombosis, fetal loss, and thrombocytopenia. Then antihistone antibody is the one that is actually related to drug-induced lupus. And then antiribosomal P protein is seen in patients with psychosis and de depression. So with a psych, uh, uh, psych psychiatric association with SLE, antiribosomal P protein, okay? And then antiribonucleoprotein is very, very specific for actually those patients with mixed connective tissue disease. Um, if you see a patient with, that you can't figure out if they have lupus, if they have SLE, if they have something else, um, and they give you that the patient has an antiribonucleoprotein positive, this is the diagnosis should be mixed connective tissue disease. It's one of those that, you know, you can't make really a good diagnosis with it. And so, therefore, you want to actually um, always get that. If you get that one, then you know what the patient has. Okay, mixed connective tissue disease. Now, which of the following is not indicated for the use of steroid in SLE? So, I kind of told you already what are the, what's the use of steroid, and I still want you to make sure that you actually know the use of steroids really well. Is thrombocytopenia a use of steroid? Well, you guys had hematology already, right? So do you use do you use steroid in patients with thrombocytopenia? Right? Right? Yes, right? Okay. What about hemolytic anemia? Is steroid a good drug? Absolutely. Renal disease, are we gonna use steroids? Absolutely. CNS disease, CNS, CNS, a couple of you are saying no, Denise and Rika, oh, whoa, 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 CNS disease, yes, in CNS disease, you're going to use steroid. Now, what about arthritis? Are you going to use steroid for arthritis? Steroid for arthritis, no, no, not for arthritis, not for arthritis. Arthritis, we can use NSAIDs. We can use, you know, any of the other. You don't need to use steroid for that, right? We don't, we don't do that. Okay, pericarditis, yes. Remember, pleuritis, pericarditis, all of those are, are, are indication for steroids. So, one of the biggest things that you need to know is actually the use of steroid in SLE. Okay, so let's see here. So, Immunosuppressive agents usually can be added to corticosteroids in those conditions where steroids is necessary if the steroids by itself do not work. So remember, the immunolog immunological abnormality, the, the, the hematological abnormality, the serositis, pleuritis, and pericarditis is an indication for steroids. Renal disease is an indication for steroids, and CNS disease also is an indication for steroids because CNS disease is actually deposition of immune complex in the actual CNS, and you want to actually um, suppress the actual immune complex um, uh, uh, activation or, or, or just deposit in those areas. Okay, Safi? So it's all related to immune complex, and that's why we actually immunosuppress this patient a little bit more if the actual patient um, uh, no, right? Arashdeep, the actual, they usually say 
that patients with room with with the arthritis of 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 you know in rheumatology, the patients with arthritis, the arthritis is not going to kill you. It makes the patient want to kill himself, but it's not going to kill them, right? Okay, so it's a very uh, common thing that that it's always known that the arthritis is not going to kill the patient. Actually, it's most of the other stuff that's going to kill the patients. So you can actually use immunosuppressive agents if the steroid by itself doesn't work for those conditions, okay? Asathioprine, you can be used, cyclophosphamide, and mecophenolate, mofetil, um, also for lupus and nephritis. If it's necessary, you're going to use all these other drugs, right? So let's talk about some of the clinical manifestations of SLE. One of them is the musculoskeletal, okay? Now, what I'm actually going to give you is the high-yield questions and, and doubts that they might put for the, for the step two, on, on your step two. Myositis, okay, is usually proximal muscle weakness in patients with SLE, okay, and they usually have an elevated CPK. Now, don't confuse that with polymyositis, which can also have an elevated CPK and proximal muscle weakness, because polymyositis is not going to have the criteria for SLE, okay? So make sure you don't start thinking of polymyositis just because there's proximal muscle weakness, right? Now, if a patient with SLE presents with musculoskeletal issues such as myositis and their CPK is normal, then you have to think of the possibility that the actual myositis is related to corticosteroid-induced myositis. They love to ask that. Okay, They actually will give you a patient with uh, SLE that is being treated with corticosteroids. The patient comes with proximal muscle weakness, CPK is normal. Which of the following is the most likely uh, cause of this patient's muscle weakness? And you know what? Most of you, if you don't think about it, it is actually related to corticosteroids. CPK is normal, okay? Very typical of that. Now, patients with myositis and SLE who have a biopsy of their muscles and there is no inflammation on the biopsy, okay, the actual myositis is not related to SLE, it's not related to um, corticosteroid, not related to anything, it's actually fibromyalgia, okay? Very important to keep those things in mind. They love to ask about the myositis, okay? Now, myositis related to polymyositis and dermatomyositis, they usually have a positive anti-JO1 antibody, anti-JO1 antibodies. Um, but it's usually, I'm talking about uh, now the myositis with a patient with SLE, and what are the things that they can actually ask you about? Now, they can have 60% of them will have cutaneous issues, right? Either a malar rash, a discoid rash, or a photosensitivity rash, as, as we saw before. Now, 40% of the patients are going to have renal involvement with an elevated creatinine, BUN, creatinine. They can have proteinuria. They can have protein cast. Um, yes. It's going to be for uh, polymyositis, the actual um, antibody that you're going to see for polymyositis is anti-JO1, okay? I wrote it right there for you, PAWAN. Now, the actual renal disease that you're going to have is going to be elevated um, creatinine, proteinuria, and certain casts. The biopsy is necessary for a diagnosis of renal disease, like we mentioned before. Steroids do not alter the biopsy result for at least six weeks. So you have enough time to start the steroid and do a biopsy, right? And remember that they're going to have immune complex deposition and damage to the kidneys. Okay, that's why because of the immune complex deposition, we want to give them the steroids, which is going to immunosuppress the patient a little bit, and it's going to reduce the damage in these patients. Now, CNS manifestation is going to be seen in 25% of the patient and it's multiple neurological manifestation. Now, in patients with um, SLE, you know that SLE is called the wolf, right? Because it just has so much stuff. I mean, it is just loaded with things, okay? So you just have to know the actual most important things because you're going to actually have a lot of different clinical manifestations in SLE. 
Now, cardiopulmonary uh, or cardiovascular manifestation is going to be pericarditis. They can have valvular abnormalities. They can have, um, they can have increased risk for coronary artery disease at a younger age. They can have Liebman sac endocarditis, which are going to be sterovalvular uh, uh, vegetations in the valves. Okay, they're not going to have um, endocarditis. This type of Liebman sac endocarditis, as you see, is sterile. It's not bacterial endocarditis. Okay, so it's associated with in patients with SLE. Now, the hematological abnormalities that you're going to see in SLE are going to be anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. These patients are also going to have antiphospholipid antibody uh, syndrome. And remember that if the patient has antiphospholipid antibody syndromes, they're going to be at increased risk of a hypercoagulable state. So DVT, PE, they're actually going to be able at, at increased risk of uh, second trimester abortions. So remember all those things. If a patient presents with uh, multiple second trimester abortion with a uh, diagnosis of SLE that you actually considered that the patient actually might have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Again, sometimes this is called anticardiolipin antibodies or lupus anticoagulant or anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1. So many other names that you can have, okay? We call it um, Arashdip. Uh, we call it steroinduced myopathy. Uh, but again, it will look like a myositis, okay? Because it's not inflammatory. That's why we don't call it myositis. Itis, inflammation, right? In steroid, it's going to be a, a myopathy. But you just you, you, use, you know, don't, don't, don't get hang up on the terms um, because they're going to look very similar to each other and they're not going to really ask you, is it going to be steroid-induced myositis or steroid-induced myopathy? Um, they're just going to tell you steroid-induced myopathy, uh, you know, and, and you never know. And they might even say myositis. So don't get hang up on just the terminology. Make sure you understand that steroids can actually cause um, a, a very similar condition to actually myositis, but they actually have a normal CPK in those instances. Okay, so let's continue here. So we talked about the hematologic abnormalities that you can have uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, you can have leukopenia, you can have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and these patients are going to have hypercoagulable state. They can actually have risk for DVT, they can have risk for PE, um, they can have risk for second trimester abortions. Okay, um, we treat those patients with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome with anticoagula anticoagulant. Okay. So, now, pulmonary conditions that you can have, you're going to have pleuritis and interstitial lung disease. Now, remember that I showed you, I told you interstitial lung disease um, causes, what are the symptoms that a patient with SLE and interstitial lung disease will present to it? Give me the symptoms that I told you. You should know those. Shortness of breath on exertion and what else? and a dry cough. Remember that, okay? Because that's how all these patients with interstitial idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, all the pneumoconiosis, asbestosis, berylliosis, silicosis, sarcoidosis, all of them are going to present with shortness of breath and exertion and a dry cough. That should be your first clue that a patient has an interstitial lung disease or a restrictive lung disease for that matter. And make sure you pay attention to the pulmonary function test because those volumes are going to be low. Okay, now in gastrointestinal manifestations of patients with SLE, uh, mostly are related to drug side effects, okay? And then in the eyes, they can actually have different types of pathologies that actually can involve the eye. Now, what is the treatment of SLE? Okay, let's talk a little bit about the treatment. We already said that we needed to actually give steroids to patients with CNS disease, hematologic abnormalities such as autoimmune hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and patients with pericarditis or the pleuritis, right? Now, for patients with uh, photosensitivity rash, the actual treatment is going to be sunscreen and avoid the sun, okay? Sunscreen and avoid the sun. That's what we do for those patients. Now, patients with arthralgia, NSAIDs are going to be very good. Now, if you're using already a steroid for another condition, 
then that will work for the arthralgia as well. But if a patient just, their main concern or their main complaint is arthralgia, you're not going to use an, a steroid for that, right? Now, antimalarial, such as hydroxychloroquine, um, and remember that the most important thing about the antimalarials is that you are going to actually have to um, check their vision, okay, on a periodical basis, right? Um, it, it's good for skin rashes, uh, yes, ophthalmological examination, Maria, and for the arthritis, right? And then steroids are used for those specific conditions that I mentioned to you. Remember that you will start the steroid and then you will do the biopsy. You don't do the biopsy before you start the steroid, right? Um, it'll take, a biopsy will take two to three weeks to be done, so you don't want to actually wait that long. So, very important. Now, we've got an, uh, a spelling error here, so disregard that. Steroid sparing agents, asafioprine, mycophenolate mofetil can be used um, if you want to spare the patient from using steroid, uh, either because of a side effect of a steroid or because uh, you know, you're just uh, concerned that the patient might have some significant side effect from the steroid. So you can use a safioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil. Uh, methotrexate can be used, cyclophosphamide, and belimumab. Okay? These are substitute instead of steroids that can be used in patients with SLE. Okay? So keep in mind that you can use some of the other uh, 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 immunosuppressive agents or uh, methotrexate and belimumab, okay, as well as a steroid sparing agent in SLE. Now, let's talk a little bit about here a patient that returns to you five months later and tells you that she is pregnant. The, the woman is pregnant now. She's concerned about her diagnosis of SLE. In advising this patient about her pregnancy and SLE, which of the following is true? Let's see here. Now, her pregnancy should not be affected by a diagnosis of SLE. Is that true? Absolutely not, right? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, Sophie, you know what? Um, you asked me if the mechanism of action of the drugs Mostly, that's going to be more for a step one. Um, could they ask you, you know what, anything is possible, but I don't think that they, might, they are going to go directly for the mechanism of action of the drugs themselves. I think that that's more for a step one type of question. Um, could they? They might throw one or two questions about it. I wouldn't waste my time trying to learn all the mechanism of actions if you don't have them right fresh in your mind. Um, that's going to take you a long time. It's going to be uh, reviewing your pharmacology all the way from the beginning. Um, so uh, most of the time they want you to know what drug it's used in these patients and just a general mechanism of action. You know, um, you don't have to actually know the actual specific about the mechanism of action. Okay, so let's continue here. So, her, is, is it true that her pregnancy should not be affected by her diagnosis of SLE? Uh, no, it is true, right? Okay, she can have second trimester abortions, right? Not only that, if she has anti rho or anti la her baby can actually be born with, with, with a problem, right? Now, she will need to be screened for anti rho and anti la antibodies. Is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. She does not have to worry about her child suffering from any of the consequences of SLE. And say, no, you know, the problem is in you. It's not the kid. The kid's going to be fine. He's going to be born perfect. No, actually, she should be concerned. Actually, the, they can actually develop a complete heart block, and that could be a big issue, especially if the mother has anti rho and anti la antibodies. So that's, that's why it's so important to do anti rho and anti la because you can alert the neonatologist at, to, to the fact that, you know what, this baby might be born with a, a, a heart block or a severe, um, you know, uh, block, and, you know, they might, be, they, might be need, they might need to be prepared to address that. Or, for example, some mothers actually like to actually 
uh, uh, give birth in their home, you might actually discourage the mother from doing that and saying, you know what, hey, you shouldn't actually do that. You should probably do it in a hospital where you would be prepared in case the baby actually is born with some sort of um, uh, a significant block and that might need to actually require a pacemaker, right? So that's very important to do. Now, spontaneous abortion and stillbirth are not common in SLE. No, they're actually common. If the patient actually has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, that could be common. So what is the actual um, answer here? She will need to be screened for anti rho and anti la antibodies. Absolutely. Yes, sir. So that's very important here. Now, let's look at this patient here. Now, if I just give you this picture, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Ah, Arashdeep. Arash yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah. What is the condition that is associated with 100% of patients with this here? Renault's phenomenon, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's see um, what the actual um, vignette tells us about here. A 38-year-old woman presents with a four-year history of severe pallor and bluish-red discoloration of her fingers on exposure to cold. The patient's other medical condition is GERD. Her condition has become worse during the last year, and she has developed swelling of her hands and wrists, as well as difficulty swallowing solids and liquids. Okay, very important to actually keep in mind here. This patient actually is presenting with um, uh, Reynolds phenomenon, and as you know, um, most of you already said that you know scleroderma causes Reynolds phenomenon. Um, a hundred percent of patients with scleroderma are going to have Reynolds, right? Now, also, scleroderma can actually affect the GI tract and causes um, esophageal dysmotility. So, the, actually, esophagus does not move really well. And so, it, one of the few things that actually can cause dysphagia to solid and liquids is going to be esophageal dysmotility, like in this patient. So, we've got esophageal dysmotility um, can cause this problem. Um, another thing that can cause dysphagia to solids and liquids from the beginning is going to be things such as achalasia. Okay? Now, you did um, do already uh, 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 gastroenterology, and you should actually be very comfortable with the diagnosis of dysphagia and how you make the differential diagnosis of dysphagia, right? Now, uh, let, let me just tell you, um, these, the, the actual... Let's talk a little bit about dysphagia because it's really important for this case here, right? Now, when you saw your, your, your gastroenterology, remember that they, when you discuss dysphagia, there's dysphagia either to solids from the beginning or dysphagia to solids and liquids. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pull a, 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 a whiteboard here so that I can actually um, explain that to you guys. Um, if I could, okay, now, oh, what is this, somebody, ceftriaxone, okay, so let's see here, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk to you about dysphagia, Dr. Noro, huh, okay, so if you have dysphagia, dysphagia, Okay, you can either have dysphagia to solids only, right? And if it's dysphagia to solids only, okay, this is probably going to be mechanical obstruction, right? Imagine that this is the esophagus, then you have a mechanical obstruction. What could this be? This could be a tumor, this could be a web, this could be a stricture, Okay, if it is rapidly progressive, rapidly progressive, then you have to think of cancer. Okay, and then you're actually going to think of the following. Is, did the patient have a history of GERD? Then you think of adenocarcinoma. 
if the patient has a history of smoking and alcoholism, you're going to think of squamous cell carcinoma. Okay? So remember, depending on what the actual um, uh, presentation is. If it is actually uh, slow, slowly progressing, then think of a benign condition, such as a stricture, a web, um, something like that. That is dysphagia to solids only. Okay. Now this also could be actually left atrial enlargement can cause this too. Okay. Impinges on the esophagus. Now if it is dysphagia to solids and liquids, you have two things, right? If it is associated with GERD, GERD. Scleroderma. No GERD. No GERD, right? Is going to be achalasia. Or Chagas disease, if it's from South America. And so there you have the full assessment of dysphagia, okay? So let's keep that in mind, okay? Because it is very important for, um, for you guys to actually know the differential diagnosis. Uh, now, so I'm going to leave that on there so that you can actually copy it if you want to. And then we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to return after the break, okay? Thank you, Arugina.
welcome back let's continue um, see if we can get the, the slides back up Eric anybody can get those for me Okay, so let's continue here. Um, so we already said that this patient probably has, um, um, because of the fact that she has dysphagia, difficulty swallowing solids and liquids, as well as GERD, that we can see here, GERD and dysphagia to solids and liquids, it's likely that this patient has um, a, a scleroderma. Okay, remember that the other condition that causes dysphagia to solids and liquids but never has GERD, it's going to be achalasia. In South America, it's going to be Chagas disease, okay? On examination, the blood pressure of this patient is 165 over 100, which tells you that there must be uh, uh, some issue with the kidneys in this patient, okay? And her hands are shown. So we already know what the diagnosis is, just based on the fact that this patient has, um, you know, her GI complaints that we have. And you should have seen that in GI, but I actually made a little parenthesis here just to actually give you a little bit more information about um, this condition, okay? And we already know that associated with Reynolds phenomenon, dysphagia to solids and liquids, as well with GERD, I don't think you will ever, ever miss that diagnosis, okay? So let's see what other conditions they actually could ask you or what other things you could actually see from this condition. Which of the following is characteristic of diffuse scleroderma? Now, very important to know that scleroderma, okay, which is usually caused by thickening of the skin, okay, is, the, is divided into two types. One type is limited scleroderma, and that's the one that you normally see, um, you know, the, the crest type of uh, a syndrome, right? And you all know crests. Um, so, a, a, a crest is basically limited scleroderma. Now, now, diffuse scleroderma is actually, one thing that I want you to actually kind of reprogram your mind is that crest really is actually in disuse, okay? And now because we use limited and diffuse scleroderma, the important thing is that we divide it based on how much of the skin is affected, okay? Because you can see crest in both diffuse and limited scleroderma. You can see, you can see Renault in both diffuse and limited scleroderma. Um, so you can see a lot of the of the of the characteristic of crest in both diffuse and limited scleroderma. So how do we divide scleroderma based on where the skin is affected? If the skin is affected distal to the elbow, okay this area, or the distal to the knee and the face is called limited scleroderma. If the skin is affected anywhere else in the body, the chest, okay, the shoulders, or, or anywhere else in the body um, that is not distal to the elbow or the face, it is called diffuse scleroderma, okay? So now, this question specifically is asking you, which of the following is a characteristic of diffuse scleroderma? Let's see. A or 1, it's associated with antibodies to centromere. Okay. Now, diffuse scleroderma, we know, is associated with antibodies to... To what? To what? Let's see if you know it. To topoisomeras 1 not centromere, that would be limited scleroderma, right? To antibody to topoisomeras 1, okay? Now, let's see number 2 here. Only affects the skin distal to the elbow. Diffuse scleroderma only affects the skin distal to the elbow? Actually, that would be just limited scleroderma, right? It affects the skin distal to the elbow and the knees, right? It used to be called Crest Syndrome. Nah, that is limited scleroderma, not diffuse scleroderma, okay? That is limited scleroderma, not diffuse, okay? Okay, now, most common initial presentation is Renault. 
actually for both diffuse and limited scleroderma, the most common initial presentation is going to be, remember that I said right from the beginning, Reynolds, right? We saw that in the picture that I gave you. And I said, okay, this is the picture. What is the diagnosis? You should actually always know that scleroderma, diffuse or actually limited, will always be associated with Reynolds phenomenon, right? So it's the most common presentation. So what are the characteristics of scleroderma? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the actual uh, theory of scleroderma. Reynolds is present in 100% of the patient for both diffuse or limited. There's two types of scleroderma, as I mentioned before. One is going to be limited, and the other one is going to be diffuse. Okay, now the skin thickening is going to be seen in almost all patients. But sometimes the skin thickening is only limited to the distal extremity or the face. And in those cases, we call it limited scleroderma. If it is, if it is affected in other areas of the body, then we call that diffuse scleroderma, right? Now, what is the pathogenesis? It's going to be excessive collagen deposition in the deep dermis. A lot of collagen deposition in the deep dermis with fibrotic changes in many of the visceral organs. That's why these patients actually can develop things like um, uh, shortness of breath on exertion in a dry cough. What does that do, huh, guys? What, is, what would you think of? That would be fibrosis of what? Pulmonary fibrosis, right? So that would actually be pulmonary fibrosis, right? So you're going to have fibrosis, fibrotic changes in many organ systems. You can actually have fibrosis of the of the heart, and these patients actually can have a restricted cardiomyopathy, right? They can have immune dysfunction, okay? They can have, the uh, it, it is predominantly in females seen, okay? There's going to be an increase in CD4 TH2 cell cytokines, okay? CD4 TH2 cell cytokines. It causes inflammation and fibrosis in these patients, and then endothelial dysfunction as well endothelial dysfunction. Remember that CD4 TH2 is one of those um, inflammatory conditions that actually um, will lead to uh, uh, acute inflammation, so on and so forth, okay? So inflammation and fibrosis is going to be the pathogenesis of these patients, okay? Now in scleroderma, which of the following is not a clinical manifestation of scleroderma? So let's see if we know this. Okay, acute renal failure. Can acute renal failure be a, a, a manifestation of scleroderma? Absolutely, right? Actually, scleroderma is one of the big things is that actually they develop um, renal failure, and you actually have to give these patients ACE inhibitors for this, right? ACE inhibitors, and if their renal failure gets worse, we don't stop the ACE inhibitor. We keep on increasing the dose of the ACE inhibitor. Very important to know that. Now, is it associated with pulmonary fibrosis, scleroderma? Remember that the inflammatory process, in the, uh, the, it causes fibrosis not only in the hands, but also in visceral organs, including in the lungs, right? So pulmonary fibrosis is going to be one of the reasons why these patients will present with what symptoms again, guys? It is a little bit bridging between pulmonary and, and rheumatology just because this is, uh, involves lung. Dyspnea on exertion and a dry cough, yes. Now, symmetric polyarthritis. Well, guess what? Everyone in rheumatology gets a little bit of joint pain, okay? So that's part of rheumatology, okay? So you're not, you're not going to miss that one, right? Okay. Now, what about achalasia? Do these patients have achalasia? Achalasia. Achalasia? What is achalasia? It is increase in the actual tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, guys, right? And what did we say that in patients with scleroderma we had? We had dilation of the lower esophageal sphincter, right? Dilation of the lower esophageal sphincter and GERD. That's why if you have increase in the tone, you could never have GERD, right? You can see that in achalasia. So remember that achalasia is not part of the actual uh, conditions that occur in patients with scleroderma. Okay? Not achalasia. Okay? Not achalasia. 
Peripheral neuropathy, yes, very frequently that you can actually have because of the fibrosis and entrapment of nerves that you can actually have uh, peripheral neuropathy in these patients. But not achalasia, guys. Remember that, okay? Remember that crest, okay, is not crest, okay? Crest is esophageal dysmotility for the E, not A. They would have called it crest, right? So very important to know that esophageal dysmotility with decrease in the lower esophageal sphincter tone, okay? Now, let's look at other manifestations of scleroderma. One of them is the kidneys. They actually can develop renal failure with malignant hypertension. And remember that in scleroderma, you have to treat it based on whatever is present in these patients. If the patients have renal failure, you're going to give them an ACE inhibitor, okay? ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitor for the actual renal failure. For hypomotility of the GI tract, they're going to have dysphagia. And you're going to, you remember there's going to be dysphagia to solids and liquid associated with GERD, right? They can have esophageal hypomotility, okay? That's why they had developed the dysphagia. They can also have hypomotility of the GI tract other than the esophagus, such as the intestines. And that will cause constipation in these patients. That will also, because of the lack of transit of the food in the actual uh, 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 gut, they can actually have um, uh, malabsorption as well. Yes, um, what I said was that if a patient with um, scleroderma renal crisis, they actually, their blood pressure, um, they develop scleroderma renal crisis. Most of the time when you develop a renal crisis on a patient with an ACE inhibitor, we stop the ACE inhibitor, except in scleroderma where we increase the ACE inhibitor if their renal function gets worse. So if the renal function gets wor on a worse on a patient with scleroderma, increase the ACE inhibitor, don't stop them, okay? Very important to know that part. Okay. Now, pulmonary um, conditions that they have is interstitial lung disease. And as you know, what interstitial lung disease is. Um, and pulmonary hypertension can occur in these patients because remember that fibrosis in the lungs and actually the blood is not able to pass smoothly through the lungs from the right side to the left side. It causes increase in pressure. And that increase in pressure actually then can lead to actually core pulmonality, meaning that the right heart is going to fail because of the fact that the actual lungs are actually damaged and fibrotic, right? And that will cause pulmonary hypertension. Then in the cardiovascular um, uh, area, you're going to have cardiomyopathy. You're going to have infiltration of fibrotic tissue in the actual heart and, and very stiff unable to actually pump blood very effectively because it's stiff, right? And so um, you're going to have a restrictive cardiomyopathy, okay? And then these patients are actually going to have lead to congestive heart failure and even they can develop pericarditis, a restrictive pericarditis. Fibrosis of the pericardium doesn't allow the pericardium to actually become compliant and so the heart tries to pump but it can't actually move outward to actually pump well, okay? So very common that these conditions, so remember, most of the conditions that occur in scleroderma is going to, is going to be related to the actual fibrosis that occurs in the different organ system, excessive collagen deposition and fibrosis in different organ system. Restrictive cardiomyopathy because there is fibrosis, Goldie, fibrosis, yeah. Fibrosis, fibrosis, fibrosis doesn't allow the heart to move. Imagine a heart that is actually uh, full of scars, okay? It just cannot move very well, okay? Yes, collagen and, and fiber deposition. That's what occurs in everywhere. That's what occurs in the hands, right? All that collagen and fiber and the hands become, I mean, the skin becomes thick and tight. The same thing happens all over the body, okay? And so that's what causes this problem in these patients. Now, let's look here. Uh, uh, which of the following is the most common cause of death in patients with chloroderma? Okay. Is it acute renal failure? Well, it used to be at one point. But what drug can we give these patients now? 
Let's see. Give me, give me the drug. A ACE inhibitors, right? And ACE inhibitor controls it very well. Pulmonary fibrosis. Is pulmonary fibrosis one of the causes of death? Yeah, you know what? Once you have fibrosis, you can't take it away from the lungs. And that will lead to actually um, uh, pulmonary, uh, just pulmonary failure. And these patients are going to die from the excessive fibrosis in the lungs. So um, very, very important to know that. Now, symmetrical polyarthritis, is that going to cause death to the patient? No, that never causes death to the patient. That's more bothersome to the patient than anything else, but really it does not actually cause death. Now, what about esophageal cancer? These patients actually can have cancer, right? And what type of cancer is associated with GERD? Anybody? Adenocarcinoma, right? And what is the precursor lesion for adenocarcinoma? Barrett's esophagus, yes. And what is Barrett esophagus? What can you tell me what Barrett esophagus is? And I'm just playing around here with you guys just to get you, um, you know, just to integrate all of this internal medicine stuff, right? Yes, it's going to be what type of metaplasia? Tell me what type of metaplasia? Yeah, glandular, but tell me from where? Where, where, where? Intestinal metaplasia. Intestinal metaplasia of the gastroesophageal junction of the esophagus. And remember that anytime you have metaplasia, you're at increased risk of developing cancer. And remember, now that you actually have changed the squamous epithelium of the lower esophagus to a glandular epithelium of the actual intestine, which is more, um, it has a more ability to actually protect its, itself from the acid that constantly is hitting it, right? It actually, you have a more predisposition for cancer of that new type of epithelium. So that new epithelium is going to be glandular epithelium, therefore increased risk of adenocarcinoma. And where is the increased risk of adenocarcinoma? In what part of the esophagus? Let's see if you guys have that one. In the lower one third, right? Because that's where you always get the red esophagus. Very good. Now, congestive heart failure. Congestive, actually, scleroderma. Remember, scleroderma will lead to what type of condition in the heart? What type of condition in the heart? A restrictive, a restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy, right? And a constrictive pericarditis. So those two things are actually can lead to congestive heart failure, right? Leads to congestive heart failure. So very important to keep in mind because anything bad enough will lead to congestive heart failure in the heart, okay? So very, very um, good. So pulmonary fibrosis is the most common cause of death in patients with scleroderma. So let's see here. Since you already had already pulmonary, right? You're already pulmonologist. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Which of the following pulmonary function tests are you most likely to find in a patient with complicated scleroderma? So first of all, what I want you to actually start thinking is, number one, is there are going to be, because it is a restrictive lung disease, how is the total lung capacity and the residual volume going to be? High or low? It's going to be low, right? So let's see which one has it low. We have B and we have C, okay? Now, the most important thing that you have to look at is going to be not so much the FEV1 over FEC, because this actually, they're kind of... Um, you know, that this could be low or it could be normal. But the actual DLCO, what does the DLCO tell you about the diffusing capacity of the patient? Okay, actually the DLCO should be, should be low or normal. Guess what? If there is damage to the actual lung itself, if there's permanent damage, and is there permanent damage on patients with scleroderma in the lungs, is there fibrosis in the lungs and damage? Absolutely. If there's permanent damage, you're going to have a low DLCO. If there's no damage, you're going to have a normal DLCO. So therefore, what is the actual answer for this patient? Absolutely. You should have no doubt about this. C, 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 C. Okay? C, 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 C is what the answer is. Make sure you know that, okay? 
Um, this patient actually has fibrosis and therefore there's damage to their lung parenchyma and therefore their DLCO is going to be normal. Now, what restrictive lung disease will cause a normal DLCO? Right, kyphoscoliosis, um, obesity, right? Arashtip, obesity can do that. Um, so, for example, um, uh, ankylosing spondylitis can cause one without a, a problem in the lung because the lungs are not going to be damaged. What's going to be damaged is the actual structure around the lungs, right? Morbid obesity, yes. So think of those things when you actually think of scleroderma. In this case, scleroderma does cause fibrosis and therefore the DLCO is going to be decreased in these patients, right? Awesome. Very good. Okay. Uh, yes, um, in patients, Rika, in patients actually with uh, a, a um, interstitial lung disease, the volumes are going to be low. Are you, are you with me with that, that the volumes are going to be low? Yes. Okay. Now, the DLCO is going to be low because there's going to be fibrosis. Are you with me with that? Okay. Now, the FEV1 over FVC tells you how well the patient is able to blow, okay, air. Now, on a patient that has a lot of fibrosis in the lung, they're going to have a little bit of difficulty blowing air. So the FEV1 over FEC is going to be less than 70%. So that's why this is also a little bit on the low side, okay? They are going to have the fibrosis are going to impede the ability of actually um, blowing air, okay? Okay, good. So let's continue here, and we're going to talk about which of the following is not part of limited scleroderma. Ah, what is not part of limited scleroderma? Sclerodactyly. What is limited? Remember, if you remember um, crest, that's the typical limited scleroderma, right? Uh, renal calculi is part of, of limited scleroderma. No, I've never heard of that. Uh, right? What about calcinosis? Yes, calcinosis. So remember, it's C, R for renos, right? E for esophageal dysmotility or hypomotility. S for sclerodactyly, okay? T for telangiectasia, right? Okay. So those are the types, not renal calculi. I've never heard of that. Okay, so that's that one I just made up. Instead of Renault, I put renal calculite to see if you knew the answer there. Okay, so what are the type of scleroderma? Remember that we have diffuse scleroderma, okay, which is actually involves the skin proximal to the elbows and proximal to the knees, right? So if anywhere in the trunk, it would be considered diffuse, right? And then limited distal to the elbows and distal to the knees, right? And it is diffuse scleroderma associated with antibodies to Toposomeras 1. Toposomeras 1. So remember that. Antibodies to Toposomeras 1. Now, limited scleroderma is associated with antibody to centromere. And it actually is limited to the skin distal to the elbow and distal to the knees. But you also can have it on the face. So make sure that you know that, that the face can be also affected in limited scleroderma. Okay? So don't make a mistake of actually saying that it is diffused because the face was affected too. So make sure you know that. Okay? So the face can be affected in limited scleroderma. Okay? Very important. Very important. Now, let's look here. Which of the following is the best treatment for this patient's hen complaint? What are the hand complaints that the patient had? What are the hand complaints? Uh, Renault. So what do we get for Renault? Renault is actually vasoconstriction. What can actually cause vasodilation? Yes, a calcium channel blocker. Great, great drug to actually treat these patients' complaint. Okay. So as you can see, depending on what the patient has. If the patient has GERD, what can we give patients with GERD? You already had... Um, uh, uh, GI, right? PPIs, right? Okay, PPIs. And if the patient has renal crisis, right? 
Their blood pressure is going through the roof. Their BUN and creatinine is going very, very high. What is the drug that you're going to actually um, increase or, or optimize? ACE inhibitors. Absolutely, right? Very important to do that. And if the patient only has just joint pain, what are you going to give them? All right, NSAIDs, right? <laughs> that's a good thing, right? So as you can see, you already know all this stuff, right? And that's what you have to know. That's, you know, it's learning how to play with all these different types of, you know, Following is the best treatment for this patient with scleroderma and pulmonary hypertension. We already talked about it. Ah, ah what do we have here? Scleroderma and pulmonary hypertension. Anybody? Anybody knows what we use for pulmonary hypertension? What is what is the commercial name for for C? Since most of you are putting C here. Viagra, right? Viagra. Okay, good. I'm happy that you guys know that. Okay, so for pulmonary hypertension, so Denafil, that's actually why um, uh, originally Viagra was actually um, uh, uh, used. As it was for pulmonary hypertension. And then it was found that actually was working very well for actually erectile dysfunction as well. Okay. Yes, there's also Bosartan. Yes, but there's that's not there here. Uh, yes. Yes, but it's not here in this in this um, in this answer. Arumina. Yes, very good. Okay, now let's see here. Which of the following? Uh, which what is the treatment of choice for patients with malignant hypertension and scleroderma? And we already saw this. That ah, uh, this one is the one that we saw. We didn't see the pulmonary hypertension before. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and you should be able to actually answer those very, very categorically. Remember, it's very important to feel confident that you know the disease process and that you're able to actually answer these questions. Um, and it's going to help you tremendously for the test. The USMLE Step 2, um, it's going to be really, really important that you know how to navigate these different types of treatment and which one you treat, why you treat it. Okay. Now, Treatment of different types of complications for scleroderma. Let's talk about them. Okay, we got Renault's phenomenon. We give them calcium channel blockers. Okay, um, we can also use topical nitrates in these patients. Okay, we can also use sildenafil as well for actually Renault's phenomenon. Okay, for GERD, we can use proton pump inhibitor. For renal crisis, we can use an ACE inhibitor. Okay, for interstitial pneumonitis. Now remember that this is going to be deposition of uh, of excessive glu uh, 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 just uh, just fibrotic uh, tissue in the actual interstitial space of the lung, um, as well as collagen. And so, immunosuppressive is going to be the most important uh, key. Uh, to try to suppress the immunity and try to reduce the inflammation that occurs, so that fibrosis does not occur in the lungs of these patients. So immunosuppressive agents such as asafioprine and cyclophosphamide are going to be actually the drugs of treatment for interstitial pulmonitis. If you actually have interstitial lung disease and you cannot actually treat it with that, then you might actually have to use lung transplantation if the patient is a, as a candidate for lung transplantation. Okay, very good, very good. Fibrosis is going to cool everywhere in the in the in the body, Maria, everywhere. But those are the areas that are more prone to fibrosis. Okay. Now let's look at another case here. Let's start to play a little bit more, right? Just uh, playing is actually good. Um, it brings the child in. You're able to remember that children. Who learns faster, children or adults? Children or adults? Children. So that's, I want to bring the child in you so that we can keep on learning as fast as we can, right? And, um, and children actually, remember, as adults, we have an issue about saying, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Children don't care saying, I don't know, okay? So make sure that you're able to actually accept to yourself that you don't know something, okay? Um, so it's a good thing to actually maintain that child in you um, and be able to say, hey, I don't know this. Let me just, you know, relearn it. You know, let me learn this stuff because I never learned it well. 
or I don't know it. And as long as you know that, you're able to actually absorb a lot of things in medicine. Now, if you start from a premise that you have to know things, then you shut yourself to learning anything else because you feel, oh God, I have to know this. I have to know. I studied it 50 times and I don't know it. Well, you studied it 50 times and you don't know it is because you are not allowing yourself to say, I don't know this topic. I need to learn it. So start from that premise of, I have to know this because it becomes really difficult to get through after you set your mind that I have to know this and you don't know it, all you do is you're just studying based on I have to know this. And you know what? And if you have to know this and you're supposed to have known it, then you don't leave any room for learning it anymore. Okay? So keep that in mind. Okay? Keep it in mind because it's really important to actually practice that in a conscious level. Okay? Otherwise, you know what? All these topics that you never learn, you never will learn it because you actually are not allowing yourself to learn them. Okay? And it's all about us. You know, sometimes it's us as adults, we actually put barriers on ourselves. And there is no barrier that you can conquer in life as long as you really, really want it. So you know what? Say, I don't know it. Let me study it from the beginning. Yes, it's a hard topic. So therefore, I never learned it. I want to learn it now. Okay? So let's continue here. A 42-year-old woman presents to your office with some peculiar symptoms that she has had over the past year or so. So this woman is 42 years old, not young, not old, right? And she's got these peculiar symptoms for about a year, so chronic, right? She feels there is constantly something in her eyes, like dust or sand. So most of the time when patients actually feel... Um, that they have dust or sand in their eyes is probably because their eyes are very dry, okay? Very important to keep in mind that, okay? And that, and that dry and solid foods are, are painful to swallow. And it's not so much painful to swallow, okay? It is that they're very difficult to swallow. So it's probably like, for example, crackers. If you take crackers, graham crackers, right, and you buy them, Go to the beach, or you know, if you're if you're here in Florida, you can always come to Florida and come to the beach with me, and then don't drink anything all all day, right? Don't drink any water, and then put put a cracker in your mouth and try to actually swallow that cracker. You're gonna see that it is going to be almost impossible for you to swallow that cracker, right? Yeah, um, so very, very difficult because you actually do not have, you a little dehydrated and you don't have enough saliva, right? So these patients actually have that too. Okay. So you are perplexed by her complaints but decide to examine her and finds that she has bilateral parotid enlargement. So she's got her parotids are actually a little bit big. Ah, what does she have? Dry eyes, dry mouth, and parotid enlargement. Bah. Okay, if you don't know this diagnosis, that's going to be, um, you know. The exam is otherwise unremarkable. An ANA is po test is positive. So let's see what they're going to ask us here. Ah, what specific ANAs would you expect to be positive in this patient? Ah, what specific ANA? Is it going to be anti-double-stranded ENA? Let's do this. Hey, guys, wait, 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 wait. Do, look, listen to me. Let's do this. I'm going to actually ask you for every single... I'm going to ask you, you know, uh, I'm going to jump around. I'm going to say, okay, double-stranded DNA is seen in what condition? And that's what I want you to tell me, okay? That's how we, we're going to play here, okay? Exactly. SLE, lupus, right? What about antihistone antibody? And I'm marking here. Antihistone antibody. Yeah, drug-induced lupus. Okay. Anticentromere antibody. And tell me specifically which one. Don't use Crest. I, you can use Crest here, but don't use it. Yeah, limited is better. Limited, better word, okay? Remember, they're not going to use Crest in the test, most likely. What about anti-Smith antibody? Where do you see that? 
Yeah, very good, guys. You are doing awesome. And remember, rheumatology is a simple topic and very high yield. Remember that if you are lucky enough to live to be over 50 years old, everybody's going to have osteoarthritis, you know? So it's one of the most common diseases that exist. And you know what? And it does not forgive almost anybody. It's like not learning diarrhea in GI. You have to know diarrhea like this because how many of you have never had a diarrhea? Let they just, I'm going to ask you that question and see. So these are frequent conditions that you have to, have to, have to um, master very well, okay? Now, what about anti rho and anti la? Where do we have he, that anti rho and anti la? Yes, you can see it in neonatal lupus and Sjogren's, absolutely. And neonatal lupus and Sjogren's. Sjogren actually has both of them, okay? So very, very, very common in Sjogren's. Now, we thought that this patient with her dry eyes, dry mouth, and actually parotid enlargement probably had um, Sjogren's, and that is completely correct. I love you guys, because you guys are really, really, really interacting with me really well, and I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, that you're here on your Sunday with me um, learning this. Um, for me, this is like a game, you know, where I love to play this, you know. Um, you know, it, this is all a game, you know, and, and this is the time to actually play with medicine. It's a, it's a beautiful um, um, topic, you know, and, and, and all medicine is actually beautiful. Now, let's look at a characteristic of Sjogren's. Um, Goldie, you're welcome. Um, and 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 Cape Boar and all all of you. Okay, um, let's look at it, the characteristic of Sjogren's. It's an autoimmune destruction of the exocrine glands. So there is going to be lymphocytic infiltration of the actual salivary glands, of the actual lacrimary glands, right? And so these patients are not able to produce enough actual tears, enough saliva. And so that's what causes the symptoms that you will have um, in, in, these, in these patients, right? Now, let's look at this here. They're going to have dry eyes, which is called keratoconjunctivitis sicca, okay? Sicca, keratoconjunctivitis sicca, okay? You can use rose bengal stain for corneal, corneal ulceration in these patients, okay? High yield. They might ask you, which of the following should you use to actually determine if this patient has corneal ulceration? It's going to be the rose bengal stain. Now, for the dry eyes and dry mouth, the serostomia, uh, these patients can actually develop dental caries. There is things that can be done, and we're going to talk about that in a little while, okay? Now, for the parotid enlargement or the parotid enlargement in these patients, typically it's going to be painless. And as you can see here, I've actually put two asterisks, okay, to make sure that you don't confuse it with the type of viral parotiditis that occurs in patients that actually have mumps or other types of issues that is painful, right? So make sure you know that the actual parotid enlargement is painless. And now these patients actually are going to have extra glandular involvement. They can have fever, fatigue, arthralgia, photosensitivity, cytopenias, right? Because it is an inflammatory condition, so they're going to have all these symptoms. Remember that symptoms of inflammation are going to be malaise, fever, fatigue, all these things that you have, right? Now, they're going to have type 1 renal tubular acidosis. Type 1 renal tubular acidosis. These patients are actually going to have type 1, which is actually distal renal tubular acidosis. Now, did you already, I think we're going to do, um, with me, you're going to do uh, nephrology, and we're going to talk about the renal tubular acidosis when we talk about nephrology, right? Okay. And then we're actually going to have lymphadenopathy. 5% will develop a B-cell lymphoma. So these patients are also going to have, actually, um, a reactive zone in the, in, the, in the lymph nodes that is going to actually, because of the chronic inflammation, they're actually going to be a, going to actually have uh, a, a, a increased risk for actually um, developing a, a type of lymphoma that's specifically for patients actually with um, 
with chronic inflammatory conditions. Now, you're actually going to also have associated with other uh, rheumatological condition, um, uh, you're going to actually have Sjogren's associated with other rheumatological conditions, right? So, um, let's see here, what do we have? Ooh, what happened here? Sorry about that. Okay. Let's see, which of the following will be most specific diagnostic criteria for these spacious medical conditions? What is the most specific di diagnostic criteria? Uh, serostomia or Sika syndrome or Schimmer's test? or biopsy of the lower lip or parotid enlargement. What is the most specific diagnostic test? And the reason why I put this here is because I know that most of you really um, don't know the actual diagnosis of this condition. Okay? Let's talk about serostomia. Serostomia is basically just, you know, the dryness and that's not specific, right? Sika syndrome is dry eyes. That's not specific for uh, Sjogren's. You can see dry eyes um, in, in patients with other medical conditions, other in, uh, rheumatological conditions. Schimmer's test is just an indication of dry eyes, right? Now, biopsy of the lower lip right there, tuk, tuk, biopsy, and take a little bit. You know that you have salivary glands right there, right? And you can actually check to see if there's infiltration with lymphocytes of the salivary glands. And if you actually find that, you make a diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome. Okay? So biopsy of the actual lower lip, the inner side, right there. <laughs> okay? The inner side, not the outside. Okay? Not the, not the lip where you actually put lipstick either. Okay? It has to be the wet part. Okay? Now, parotid enlargement is not typical of this. So, diagnostic criteria for Sjogren's. Let's talk about them, okay? Either dry eye symptoms, dry mouth symptoms, positive Schimmer's test or Rose Bengal test, lower lip biopsy, and as you can see, I've actually um, put this in, in bold because it is very important, okay? Um, yes, and it's, it's going to be biopsy of the lower lip, the answer, Suzanne. Um, saliv salivary gland involvement also is another criteria and then anti rho and anti la is another criteria so you can actually use four including four and six okay four and six if you have four of these including four and six okay or any three from three to six any three from three to six any three, one, two, three, one, two, three, okay? So four, including four and six, or any three would give you the diagnosis. But most of the time, just as long as you have that lower lip biopsy, most of the time they have dry eyes, dry mouth, they can have the lower lip biopsy, and if they have dry eyes, they already have a positive Schirmer's test, okay? Yes, Jose, uh, lymphocyte, infiltration of, of the actual salivary glands with lymphocyte, lymphocytic infiltration of the salivary glands, Jose, is what they look for. Sounds good? Yes, perfect. Now, remember that it is not going to be Sjogren's if the patient had previous head or na neck radiation. Head or neck radiation actually will cause dry eyes, dry mouth, a positive Schimmer's test. They can actually have um, a, a infiltration of the salivary glands by lymphocytes. So that does not actually, um, uh, uh, if they do have uh, radiation, you can't say it's Sjogren's. If they have hepatitis C, you can't say it's Sjogren's because it causes that as well. AIDS, patients with HIV AIDS can actually have symptoms very, very similar to Sjogren's. Pre-existing lymphoma, okay, they usually have very symptoms very similar to that. Sarcoidosis, graft versus host, and use anticholinergic drugs can actually cause symptoms just like this. 
So I would keep that in mind, okay, that you cannot make a diagnosis of Sjogren's in patients that have had neck, okay, or head radiation, hepatitis C, hepat AIDS with these criteria, pre-existing lymphoma, sarcoidosis, graft-versus-host disease, or use of anticholinergic agents. That's probably the, 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 the Sjogren's is actually caused by their condition, not by primary Sjogren's disease. Okay, so which of the following is the most appropriate for the treatment of this patient? Um, it just has, it, so that, uh, hepatitis C will cause dry eyes, dry mouth, um, and it will cause a positive Schimmer's test, and so it can actually cause parotid enlargement as well. Okay, so it's just, it causes similar symptoms, but it's not Sjogren's. So let's continue here. Which of the following is appropriate for the treatment of this patient's dry mouth complaint? Okay, let's see. So atropine, cyclosporin, okay, sevemeline, methotrexate, or adalimumab. So what is the treatment for? Um, let's see. So Danis, you say it is C, Miles C, yes, Nabila C, yes, very good. Seve, sevimeline is actually the treatment for these patients with dry mouth, okay? So sevimeline is the treatment for dry mouth. So let's talk a little bit about the actual treatment of Sjogren's disease, okay? Um, it used to be that Sjogren's, we didn't have much that we could offer the patient other than artificial tears, artificial saliva. Okay, now we've come up with a couple of other things, right? So, keratoconjunctivitis sica, okay, which is basically a dry eyes condition of these patients. We can still use artificial tears, okay? We can use cyclosporin A eye drops, okay? Cyclosporin A eye drops can also be used Okay, and also you can actually use silicone plugs in the tear drainage ducts, okay, opening of the lower eyelids, okay, and in the little holes, a little plug of silicone actually then doesn't allow the actual small amount of tears to be produced to actually to stay nice and moist, right, and not as, 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 as dry. So again, artificial tear, cyclosporin A, and silicone plugs. And the silicone plugs are usually have to be done by an ophthalmologist. Now, serostomia, or dry mouth, okay, muscarinic agents such as sevimeline or pilocarpine, okay, can be used, okay. It increases acetylcholine and increases tears and saliva in these patients. So, sevimeline. It's a good one, and that's the one that we had on our patient here, uh, muscarinic agonist, okay, um, or pilocarpine can be used. It increases acetylcholine, okay, and increases the tear and saliva production in these patients. Sevimeline, okay. Now, arthralgia, what do we use for arthralgia? We're going to actually use NSAIDs like we mentioned before, okay. Or we can use, actually use hydroxychloroquine as well. And remember that I said that if you're going to use hydroxychloroquine, what is going to be the important thing in these patients? An eye examination every six months to a year, right? If you do it once a year, it's good enough. Okay, so let's change, let's switch a little bit gears here and let's talk about another disease before we go for a little break. Um, a 21-year-old man presents with complaints of pain on his heels while walking, sever uh, while, while, while walking, severe low back stiffness and pain that have been bothering him for the last five years. So a chronic condition, a young man with low back pain, what does that make you think of right away? And the first thing you have to think of, this is a young guy, 21 with low back pain for the last five years at 16, that's very unusual. You don't see young kids with low back pain, right? So yes, you're going to have to think of possibility, maybe ankylosing spondylitis. The stiffness is most apparent in the morning, okay, when he wakes up, lasting somewhere about two hours. 
what does the stiffness tell you about the patient's condition? If it is greater than 30 minutes, we know that it is going to be inflammatory, right? So now we know that we have an inflammatory condition that affects the low back. So now let's go over the differential diagnosis of inflammatory condition that affect the low back. I'm going to actually want you to remember. Number one is going to be ankylosing spondylitis. And number two, let's see if anybody knows another one. Right, reactive arthritis, reactive arthritis, right? Now, osteoarthritis rica is not inflammatory, okay? Osteoarthritis, reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, very good. And now another one that is actually not really a rheumatological condition, but it's more a gastrointestinal issue, but actually causes also pain uh, in the actual low back inflammatory bowel disease, right? Inflammatory bowel disease. So now we have the differential diagnosis of those actually seronegative spondyloarthropathies, okay, that I want you to remember. Let's go over them again. Ankylosing spondylitis, ankylosing spondylitis psoriatic arthritis, right? Inflammatory bowel disease, inflammatory bowel disease and reactive arthritis always just keep them in mind okay they always affect the back and they're related to an inflammatory process now it improves with exercise okay now let me just introduce another concept conditions that are inflammatory gets better with exercise conditions that are not inflammatory get worse with exercise so for example osteoarthritis gets worse with exercise remember and if you remember this, you're never going to forget this, this, this piece of information. Grandma, do you want to go play basketball? Grandma is going to say, are you out of your mind, me playing basketball? Why is that? Because grandma is going to be, I mean, her arthritis is going to flare up everywhere. Grandma does not want to move too much, right? She is on her chair and she does not want to move, right? So the uh, osteoarthritis gets worse with movement, okay? Without movement. Inflammatory conditions get better with movement, get worse with rest, okay? Now, on examination, he has a diastolic 2 over 6 murmur over the left sternal border and there is pain on palpation of his heels okay so he has Achilles tendinitis right and he's got a 2 over 6 murmur that is diastolic what type of murmur is that a murmur of what anybody aortic regard good Denise very good which of the following pulmonary function test is likely to be found in this patient now, this patient is going to have, is it a restrictive or an obstructive condition? Just answer me that, and then we're going to, a restrictive, right? So his total lung capacity and his residual volume should be high or low? Low, right? So we know it cannot be A. We know it cannot be uh, B here, right? Okay, because this is elevated, right? So it could be D or C, C or D, right? So let's see. Now, if the patient actually has, does this patient have damage to the lungs? Or is his problem related to a musculoskeletal issue? No damage to the lung, right? It's extra pulmonary. So how is the DLC? Which of the two have, has a normal DLCO? C, absolutely. So as you can see here, it's very easy to get this stuff. If you really kind of organize your mind and go pop, 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 you get the diagnosis really, really well. Just don't get bogged down with all the information because then you're going to actually want to interpret other stuff that might not necessarily be interpretable, okay? So very important to actually keep in mind that. Now, let's talk about the spondylo, uh, uh, 
Yes, it's a curvature that actually these patients don't allow them to actually take a deep breath and and, and blow out. Spondyloarthropathy are seronegative arthro arthropathies, right? The diseases that I want you to keep in mind. Reactive arthritis, the old writers that we used to call, right? Ankylosing spondylitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and psoriatic arthritis. These are going to be very easy, okay? The reactive arthritis, you're going to have um, urethritis, arthritis, conjunctivitis, right? Or you're going to have uh, a diarrhea, uh, a conjunctivitis, and arthritis, right? So it can be GI or GU issue. Ankylosing spondylitis is going to be a young man with actually mostly their actual spine affected with decreased spinal mobility. Inflammatory bowel disease is going to be somebody with a chronic inflammatory diarrhea, right? A little bit of blood in their stools or achiness, malaise, weakness with their diarrhea. And then psoriatic arthritis is one of those that also is going to affect the back, can affect the skin, and then it will also affect the young, the, 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 the small um, joints of the hands as well, psoriatic arthritis, okay? What are the, the general characteristics of, of spondyloarthropathies? Well, they will have HLA-B27 positivity. They're going to have seronegativity for ANA and rheumatoid factor. They can involve the lower back and the sacroiliac joints, very common. And they'll have extra articular manifestation, most of them, right? When we talked about each one of the extra articular manifestation, we're going to talk about every single one of them um, after we come from the break. They develop inflammation and calcification of the emphasis, so they'll develop emphysitis, and then they can actually have new bone formation in these patients. And these are the spondyloarthropathies. Now, um, I know that you guys have a one-hour lunch break right now. We've actually been here for three hours. We're going to go for another three hours, and we're going to finish in three hours our rheumatology. Um, I hope that you're enjoying it, and I hope you get something to eat, not too heavy, so you don't fall asleep on me. So I'll see you in about an hour or so. Okay, if you have any questions, you know, just write it in... Uh, I'll try to be back within uh, within 40 minutes and answer them for you, okay? I'll give you my email in case you guys want to interact with me.